try to live by the gun, or you die by the sword. Almighty listeners, accept our episode so that the new season of The Good, The Bad, and The Weird podcast shall bear fruit. Mighty listeners of Apple Podcasts, bountiful listeners of Google Podcasts, abundant listeners of Spotify, and meager listeners of YouTube in search of free movies, accept our episode and take in the wisdom and insight we have to share. I'm Nico. And I'm Chris. And that was... Beautifully done. <laughs> Welcome to season five of the Good, the Bad, the Weird podcast. Woo-hoo. For those who uh, have not guessed it, we are doing The Wicker Man. One of your all-time favorite movies, to the point of when I was explaining a standard holiday that my family participates in regularly, May Day, mm-hmm. um, you were like, oh yeah, it's kind of like when you sacrifice people. And I was like, it is not. <laughs> well, well, I mean... I appreciate that your one connection to this real holiday was this movie. Well, I do have another connection. The village over from us where I lived in uh, Germany had a maypole. So I've known about it for a while, but my main connection to it is the Wicker Man. Which, honestly, that's fair. That's understandable. (laughs) Yeah, I think this is like one of the first ones that we actually had like a movie night to watch. Because we watched this one and the Cage one. And we that, did. We did watch them both. Yeah, that's right. We are doing the original Wicker Man because it's not November yet. That's correct. So, but for those who don't know, the Wicker Man is about a cop who travels to remote Scot or to a remote Scottish island to investigate a missing girl. And honestly, this is one of the like movies that, on paper, doesn't sound like a terribly complex horror film. Mm-hmm. And yet, this movie manages to become unsettling and rememberable in, like, a very specific way. Yeah. Yeah, no, very very much so. And it's also one that just sits out because as much as I love this movie, I always forget that it's a bit of a musical, so... I like that you say it's a bit. I have a quote from several of the cast members saying it was, in fact, a full musical. Yeah. Like they got like halfway through and they're like, wait, are we just making a musical? <laughs> but it doesn't like follow. So, uh, it... Cr- Crim from, uh, or Patrick from uh, Chicken on the Stick podcast, I, he brought up in his La La Land episode that he has uh, three categories of musical mm-hmm. of like, it, like explain to like people that if you don't like musicals, you're not watching the musicals that you like. That's true. There's, there's types. Yeah, there's yeah. like the stage production. Mm-hmm. There's the one that just kind of happens as things are ha- or along with it. Mm-hmm. And then there's ones that blend in with the rest of the movie as a natural part of the movie. Like there's just music happening to the people in the movie. Yeah. As yeah. opposed to like high school musical spontaneously everyone knows choreography. Exactly. I see. Yes, I I agree. There is definitely styles and this is much more of a natural flow. Yeah. And I butchered his explanation of it. So go check out La La Land. He does a better job with that than yes. I do. Um, also, just heads up, we have we have a handful of musicals planned for the first part of this season that already. That was a little bit of an accident. <laughs> I did forget how much music was in this. Yeah. Um, as well... I know we keep saying we have stuff planned out, but I realize in writing the outline for this that the first five main episodes we're doing is about contacting the other side or reaching for something higher in either a spiritual or existential way. Maybe this is just a sign that it's time for our personal growth and journey through movies. Eh. The Wicker Man is going to be our first start into our religious experience, and by the end of this movie, we can decide whether or not we are a devout Christian or a devil-worshipping pagan. Yeah. I mean, we already know. <laughs> yeah, we already know that answer, but still. <laughs> yeah. So, The Wicker Man was released in 1973. It's directed by Robin Hardy. It's written by Anthony Schaefer, um, as well as Hardy, and it's also uncredited based on uh, David Piner's novel Ritual. Yeah. Um, it stars Edward Woodward, Christopher Lee, and Britt Eklund. Oh, um, yeah. And we might have to do a small revisit at this at some point because uh, not not only did I learn in writing this that there is a book called The Wicker Man, the official story of the film, is supposed to come out later this year. Mm-hmm. But today when I was on the internet, uh, yes. there is a five disc special edition set of this going to be released. Which would make a lot of sense because 
You own already two copies of this. Yes, I bought. So I have the uh, re- the regular copy release, and I had to dig and find the special release of the one that was released around the same time the Nicolas Cage one was being released. Yes, because as we'll get into, this movie had several iterations of itself mm-hmm. in both decreasing and increasing lengths. <laughs> Which has become a problem, because back in the day, things weren't just saved to a hard drive. Uh, things were, like, physical. And so mm-hmm. when we cut things, we literally, like, dropped them somewhere, and, like, people have been looking for them for a very long time. I think there's even a Facebook group that is still looking for the missing footage. Yeah, no, there there's a lot of people who are looking for missing films still. Like, uh, Krim recently, uh, what was it? Some movie, it's, it's like the second... It was from the second Academy Awards, because mm-hmm. he's going through all the Academy films right now. Ooh, a good challenge. And it was one that was nominated, but, like, none of it exists. Like, they have they have the trailer and a little bit, but nothing really. Which is, nowadays, hard to imagine, because, like, even movies that, like, maybe you don't have the physical copy of, there is a version of it somewhere, even if it's just in the Wayback Machine on the internet. Mm-hmm. But, like, yeah, movies that, like, weren't even, like, oh, this is a bad movie, or... This isn't a very loved movie. Like, good movies just have either all of them or just parts of them disappear. And that is part of the, I think, appeal of mm-hmm. The Wicker Man. Because on top of being very good with stellar acting and wonderful music and being reproduced so that it actually looks really good now, too. I'm sure the new set will look even better based off of the pictures that I saw. But the yeah. the intrigue the little like fun mystery in the back of your mind of like in some grandpa's closet is the missing footage yeah it's like that what was it the uh doctor who episodes that were found in some warehouse in africa or uh-huh. something yeah yeah something yeah. along those lines yeah it's just it it, it adds and it, this is such a perfect movie to have like oh just part of it might be somewhere in someone's house like this movie specifically that just really ties in with the entire vibe of the movie if you will Mm -hmm. no exactly Uh, kind of like a search for the lost knowledge or a forgotten ignored history yes (laughs) (laughs) and so our our sources for this episode today are the commentary from various members of the horror community uh interviews in association with the associate musical director uh gary uh, carpenter director uh robin hardy commentary by hardy christopher lee Edward Woodward, um, as well as moderator uh, Mark uh, Kermode. Um, We also, this is becoming a very popular use of our resource. Yes. A New History of Witchcraft, Sorcerers, Heretics, and Pagans by Jeff B. Russell and Brooks Alexander, which, weirdly enough, I bought for our uh, Hocus Pocus (laughs) episode and never used it for that. Yes, a good source. Um, But also the documentary Woodland, uh, Woodland's Dark and Days Bewitched, A History of Folklore, or Folk Horror, uh, horror Cinema, edited by Paul Duncan and Jürgen Mueller. Um, as well, I m- do want to mention that I don't have the deepest knowledge on the accuracy of the folklore, but we'll get we'll get into it in parts when we can. Yes. Just because there there is a lot and there's th- there's a little bit to it. And I'll, I'll get into the history just here. Yeah. So, now before we do really get into the movie, I have... Been a bit of, on a deep dive of folk horror recently, thanks to uh, SB Film Viewer and Paul bringing up All the Haunts BRs, a compendium of folk horror. So yeah. I've, been, I've been doing a bit of a dive. Um, but I also learned that The Wicker Man is considered one of what's called the big three mm-hmm. that sparked the uh, resurgence of the genre in the late 60s and early 70s, as well as came to define the dra- genre, at least in a broad term. Yes. Uh, the other two being... Uh, the Witch or Witchfinder General in 1968, as well as the Blood on Satan's Claw in 1971. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're also originally, uh, they eventually became named the Unholy Trin- Trinity by Adam Sovel in his article Where to Begin with Folk Horror for, for, for the British Film Institute. And it's a fitting name for them. Oh, yeah, definitely. I also think that this film specifically helped very much not just define it, the. Um, folk horror genre on paper as like horror involving Mm -hmm. uh folk history practices or tales but like narrowing that down a little bit more to like 
having a certain feel or vibe or tendencies, a lot of those tropes, especially that we see now being reworked or redone, Mm -hmm. the Wicker Man started. Yeah, it's very similar to how in uh, the underground Japanese cyberpunk movement, Burst City kind of created the idea, but Tetsuo the Iron Man refined it to what we associate with that genre. Yes. So, like, when you think full core, the first thing you end up thinking about, even if you're not specifically thinking about the Wicker Man, I bet you 10 bucks was started in the Wicker Man. Oh, yeah. And so we won't be going into a deep dive of the genre itself, and I'm not sure we could do as good of a job currently, uh, especially compared to, like, Woodland's Dark and Days Bewitched, A History of Full Core. That documentary is... Mwah, which, I mean, if you haven't heard of it or if folk horror interests you in general, spend a good afternoon watching it. Oh it's gosh, a yeah. three hour and 14 minute documentary covering pretty much anything you need to know to get started down a folk rabbit, folk, folk horror rabbit hole. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but we'll, we'll put in the interesting bits of history where we where we can. Yes. And I do want to go over the history wise where this film sits in a more societal context. Okay. So, for social context, uh, we are in post uh, Garda- uh, Garden- uh, mm-hmm. Gardanian Wicca. Yes. Which at this point had spread to all parts of Britain by the late 50s and early 60s. And we begin to see it uh, start to diversify through people such as Alex Sanders, um, who had big changing effects on overall witchcraft as we know it today. Yes. Um, and specifically, just. There are myths that, and I, I, part of the reason I like the Wicker Man too is because it does continue that myth that in some parts of the world there's this ancient, uh, pagan, uh, witch or society that's yeah. existed or they survived through the Middle Ages. Like they made it through the Christian, uh, sweep of the area. Yeah. For everyone who says that historically, that never happened. All of our paganism comes from the Middle Ages and re- rewriting or assuming what pagans would have worshipped all that shit died Uh, unfortunately but this is a really fun like revisiting of it Mm -hmm. especially something that i think the wicker man does really well especially compared to other attempts at folk horror especially in the 70s and 80s where satanic panic was happening a little bit more strongly Mm -hmm. um was this idea of like having the um clearly demonic pagan beliefs but hiding them underneath this, like, Christian lens to, Mm -hmm. like, soften the horror blows that were going to come. Whether or not historically, culturally accurate, completely irrelevant. This is strictly for horror movie speak. Yeah, comparative to, like, Rosemary's Baby or The Exorcist, which... Went in hard. (laughs) Yeah, which uh, propagated the uh, St. Peter's Cross becoming a symbol of the devil, the inverted cross. Oh, no. See, okay, but that that (sighs) and The Wicker Man's, like, those sorts of horror movies, Mm -hmm. these sorts of horror movies have physically changed people's concepts and ideas to the point where, like, it is thought that that is, like, religiously, historically factual. Mm -hmm. And that is the power that I love that these movies have, because I guarantee you a lot of people who think that have not even seen that movie or recognize that's where the original tie's from. Yeah, uh, and I mean, that's I've been running into that, too. Uh, I watched uh, Samurai Fiction for the first time, and didn't realize that this was a big influence on kill bill so yeah, oh and yeah i i always forget like, but like you it's one of those things where like you've become so used to it mm-hmm. you don't re- you don't necessarily have a chance to sit down and think about where all these source threads are coming yeah from. like um what was it uh, going back to kill bill again because tarantino's a big ass film nerd mm-hmm. um the whole bleep Oh, uh, my favorite ringtone from the 90s. I know it it was in a different movie before, but the first time I saw it was in the first movie in the Shaw Bros, which I think is The Boxing King. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, so that that's where that's where I'm, I'm watching that. I'm like, okay. And I looked it up, and I guess that was probably where it was came from, not the original source. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but back to The Wicker Man. Uh I think this, as well as the other two movies, it helped establish, or they just came about at the right time. They really did. With alternate alternative religions being more in vogue. Yes, um, especially at- ones that, like, the general, especially, like, traditionally hard Catholic side would see as, like, ah, you think you've created a religion, but I know the truth. You've created a cult. Yeah, especially from, like, our just real quick brief 
the summary of here's where witchcraft was at this point. Yes. Yeah. Um, but where did the genesis of the Wicker Man actually come from? Uh, according to Hardy, he said it came from a weekend at his island. At his island. <laughs> oh, I love to have my own island. Where he and Schaffer uh, wanted to create a 20th century pagan society, as was a more intellectual horror that was different from the then popular Hammer horror formulaic movies of the times. Speaking of that sort of horror, we ended up with a lot of those actors and actresses in this movie mm -hmm. who were looking to break out from those roles. Yes. Hardy said that horror was missing old horror. So so like Eldritch, H.P. Lovecraftian. Which I can see where like some of those tendrils are coming from because it's definitely relying more on the concepts to spook you mm -hmm. than the actual imagery. Like there is some scary imagery in yeah. there. But compared to like what was being produced at the time, which was a lot of like Dracula and Frankenstein, blah, 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 blah. Like, not a whole lot of just, like, ah, the idea that mm -hmm. you might be sacrificed to a sun god on a random island. Well, and that's the thing, is they had, they, they thought they had never seen a film on sacrifice itself. Which, for where they were, and, like, especially what was popular around that time, probably hadn't. The few ones that I can remember are much older, and probably not as popular. Yeah. Actually, no, definitely not as popular because the like two I can think of were silent films and they were like short goofs. Yeah, and they're they're cheesy. They're not the they, Yeah, they weren't meant to be like true horror. They were meant to be like, oh, tee hee goosebumps horror. Exactly. Which they also wanted to create a game for the protagonists with uh uh trails of hints along the way, basically creating one Christian amongst a group of pagans. Yes, and it also sort of helped open up this idea of in horror film leaving that breadcrumb trail for the audience to follow the mm -hmm. uh main hero along with to solve the mystery and also experience the horror along with that as opposed to just being laid out the whole thing for you yeah and as someone who's not religious it's kind of like the opposite for me of playing find the heathen at weddings it is the opposite of find the heathen it is find the one christian man and he stands out very well in this film yes bless him <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, and it's also something similar to a novel called Sleuth that just so happened to be written by Schaefer himself in 1970. Yes. <laughs> um, as well, the games themselves were inspired by something Hardy, Schaefer, and Schaefer's twin brother would play with each other, of like sending uh, someone on a long trail to get to a hotel that was 20 feet from where they had lunch and set off all their different routes for the day. Delightful. A yeah, good just, game. Yeah, stuff like that. He went on to, like, this some long rant of, like, he sent his buddy onto, like, some Italian restaurant, but old SS members were there. Like, it was just, like... <laughs> You know, this man's idea of a game is maybe not mine, but <laughs> no, I'd appreciate his idea they're, of a they're, game. They're weird. <laughs> but yeah, he went on a couple examples of that. I'm like, I, I don't... I get where he's coming from as far as, like, how he thought up the roundabout way mm -hmm. to design this, which is essentially a murder mystery, but you are the murder victim. Yeah. Um. So, like, I like that thought process, especially because for this time period, most of the, like, well-known and popular murder mystery writers their way of logicking through that puzzle mm -hmm. is very different to this it was usually a backwards to front sort of method purposefully putting red herrings in the way and then the really good ones would work back to front on those red herrings to mm -hmm. meet all at the beginning this instead he worked from the front back because he had already played these games in real life and was like oh this one's gonna be like the time i sent this guy over to this one place and turned out everyone there was a prostitute and topless <laughs> ah ha ha good time <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> Um, but at the same time, Christopher Lee was looking to expand his career past the typical Hammer Horror roles that he had previously played. Um, so he, want, he wanted a more complex villain uh, to present himself that he was interested in. And also, it doesn't hurt that this role was written for him. Yeah. Um, not to mention that he also immediately knew that was based off the druids from the title alone. Because we got to remember, Christopher Lee is was a very... <laughs> And he was into, like, the occult and stuff, oh, too. So he's... Yeah, the most mysterious man in Hollywood, arguably, ever. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go back to our Lord of the Rings reference about... <sighs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Eventually, when we do uh, Star Wars, we will have to revisit Christopher Lee once again. <laughs> yes. Um, and although it's not a source for us, it's important to bring up that 
the, this book called the gold uh, 1980s the gold or uh, sorry 1890s the golden bow by james forge frazier which was used as a main source for the movie and i know it's anthrop uh, anthropologically extremely flawed it is but I... from a literally a literary aspect it brought a lot of influence i have i have it i've had it for like a year or so now but i never read it i i flipped through it for this um mm-hmm. mostly looking for like where they got some of these ideas and it is even for when this movie was being written this would not have been like a high source not gonna lie it's more of like a for funsy sort of look the author clearly tried to take themselves seriously, but even by the time this movie came out, it was mm. very dated. I think it was like ten or fifteen years old by this point. Oh no, it was way old. It was it was getting close to a hundred. This movie this oh, book came right. out in eighteen ninety. That's right. Yeah. Uh, wrong. I had the numbers backwards in yeah. my head. Yeah. I also so, like, said them wrong to begin with. <laughs> that so. doesn't help. <laughs> um. So like, not only was this dated from when the time they started writing, but like the. <laughs> the dear gentleman who did the writing and research, when he couldn't find stuff, he just kind of, like, filled it in. Mm-hmm. Um, Not bad, especially if you take this as, like, a fun read as opposed to, like, a resource. So, like, I can see where they got their inspiration yeah. and some ideas. His half of it based in fact. No, I would say maybe, like, a quarter at best. And to be fair, at the time when the book was being written, there wasn't a whole lot of research actually really being done back then, and so... And also the idea and definition of research was much different. Yeah, he... The, the fact this man had any sources at all was good enough. Fraser was an armchair anthropologist. Yes, and when we say armchair, I mean, like, I don't think he traveled to go look into these. No. But, like, it is a fun source, so, like, if you enjoy this, it is a fun book to flip through. Yeah, very much how we are armchair movie reviewers. <laughs> we very much are, but you know what? Unlike him, movies are best watched from an armchair. Yes. And so, to note as well, we are reviewing the extended edition to the 111-minute uh, edition, I think it's what it is. I was going to say, unfortunately, because this movie has been Frankensteined back together so many times, you do have to kind of, like, if you're going to talk with your friends about this v- version, it might help to tell them how many minutes were in the film. Because there's been a few versions. It's about, fi- it's a, no, it's 11 minutes of extra footage that was added to this one that the original and the most common copy that you'll find won't have. So yes. if you've watched this movie and we talk about something that you don't remember at all, it's because it was in the old movie. It's it's in the long cut. Yes. And before we get into the movie, Chris, what are we drinking today? Well, it's meant to be a dead guy ale. By but, Rogue. But they are having a fun version where you're supposed to color your own can. So it just kind of looks like generic beer. And yeah. I love it. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. We also have, at least for me, water that is not the correct color. Which is honestly <laughs> real on theme for this movie. Yes. Uh, also on theme for what we do in general, because Rogue also makes uh, bat squatch. That's which, true. Uh, yeah. That's true. <laughs> uh, so, The Wicker Man. Yes. We open on a thank you to Lord Summer Isle and the people of his island, which I like this approach. I do too. This is a clever way of like getting people to think there's more behind this than there is. Yeah, it's a very clever way of... Or in, interesting way of saying based off true events without outright stating it's based off true events. And also simultaneously actually thanking the areas that they filmed on on set. Because they were in people's business for a while. Yeah, but they were cool with it. No, they were very cool with it. And I think there's some of them in the background, which makes it better. Yeah. And we get a little bit of setting up where the movie's going with that. Um, uh, there's... Well, we get we get this plane flying in, mm-hmm. kind of a generic-ish shot with uh, the, uh, or in some credits, too. Yeah. Um, and we get a cop coming on board saying that, or there's some graffiti that says, Jesus saves, and then they've got to go. But I like how this sets up, it sets up Howie as being, he takes a moment to pause about the graffiti. Yes. But ultimately, he's a cop. In his graffiti, regardless of its mes- mes- me- message and his ideology. However, I think this is a really clever way of, without necessarily telling the audience, because nowadays I think it is a little less obvious, but when this movie came out, this would have been a very, um, like, con- like this would have been a connection point for a standard Christian audience member 
and this main character because this was like during the height of the idea of Christians will be persecuted wherever you go. Mm -hmm. And so this is like already planting the seed of like, ah, he is a good, solid man. He is questioning the world around him, but like he's also a cop. Those are like two things hand in hand. Yeah. Well, and on top of that, so while they're driving back, he's talking to his buddy where he's like, what did I miss? Oh, you missed the usual rape, sodomy, and sacrilege. The, the usual. I, I, I like that the movie tries to use these, like, very church sermon specific mm-hmm. words. And even the movie knows that, like, this is an awkward way to, com- like, have a conversation. Well, it, it's it's awkward because Howie's so stiff about it all, too. How, okay, I like that you call Howie stiff because I would argue that Howie is stiff all the time. This man has the most starch on every part of his clothing. And not stiff where it counts. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's also important to note here a little bit because uh, this some of the dialogue sounds a bit odd. A little bit. For modern audiences, but we gotta remember that homosexual relations, at least in Scotland, was not decriminalized till 1981. And even without being decriminalized, at least in the EU, and especially in the US, it was still something that you didn't necessarily, like, publicize Mm -hmm. if you were a quote-unquote good Christian cop. Yeah, growing up uh, in the military, don't ask, don't tell. Yeah, and that was, like, the looser area. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, but it's also showing, uh, it's continuing how uptight the world is, even if the other cops around Howie aren't up, as uptight as him. They're not as good a cop as he is. No, exactly. Because they're not as Christian as Howie. Remember yeah. that. Because <laughs> immediately we cut to a church where Howie is shown to be pious and devout. Um, Howie and... needs a new hobby. It could yeah. be paganism. <laughs> uh, it one... will be, real soon. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's just a good... A few short minutes of us getting how concrete how he is because even at the yes. station that we cut to there's a postcard and his other cop buddies are ragging on him how they feel bad for his girlfriend because he's such a pure virgin howie that like he's like they're like they're not no gonna fun. have sex until their wedding night how could they this time yes i also appreciate that because of how this movie is set up, it is both a it is a double edged sword of Howie's personality that he is so uptight, mm-hmm. and like this is his uh, even according to the movie, like this is his one personality trait. Yeah, it's also setting him up as not only an outsider when he gets to Summer Isle, but an outsider when he's in like, his in his own comfort zone area, basically. Yes, and I think that this works to our advantage really well because this movie is well written and acted enough. That if there had even been a hint of him being, having more personality than just kind of this, Mm -hmm. there would have been room for doubt and questions later on when things start getting more suspicious and spooky. Yeah, they had to make him as pure as possible. It's kind of like how uh, uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure was originally set up. Oh, yeah. With the uh, original JoJo, Jonathan Joestar, being written as the most pure of the characters that they could, that the, I can't remember the guy who actually wrote writes uh jojo's bizarre adventure <laughs> he he wanted it to be like the pure spot to start from and then you could make his descendants less and less pure or less or less gentlemanly as jonathan would want to be called <laughs> the yeah. ultimate gentleman the ultimate gentleman <laughs> yeah uh but also this scene is great for setting up summer isle because they bring up that all oh, the apples from summer isle are the best but i hear the folks there are a bit weird yes so it's it's just the part of the reason this movie does so well in the beginning is just everything is set up and so direct, but they're mm-hmm. not like they're they're using dialogue, but they're also showing in the posture of Howie and everyone else kind of being a little more loose. Normal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But from here, we how he sent on to find he gets the postcard uh, about the missing girl and we cut to him flying over Scotland as the rest of the credits play, which is kind of a weird thing seeing. Like, just, we get a little bit of credits at the beginning, and then there's, like, 
five minutes and then more or two minutes and then like more credits so according to christopher lee there was supposed to be a little scene in between right there of like him talking to someone else higher up in Mm -hmm. the police force that would have had more credits to like work with and like yeah would have made this flow a little bit better something that christopher lee like really harped on was like no the missing minutes really changed like to Mm. him at least he felt it changed the pacing and the appearance enough to bother him um and so like this is one of the parts that in one of his much later interviews like looking back on this movie that he was really remiss of like i wasn't part of this part of the filming but i know that exists yeah that 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 just goes to show like just how much christopher lee was emotionally connected to this movie and how much he loved it just from the viewpoint of he was worried about the movie he was in not yeah. Not worried about just a paycheck, basically. Yes, he was very, very invested in this film, not just as like, oh, this is going to be my breakout role. Like, mm-hmm. he saw this movie as more of like a project that he really was passionate about as opposed to just a movie. Yeah, which I think that's the whole demeanor of this movie is. Cause it th- th- this like movie, everyone. Well, this movie was low budget, too. And that's the yeah. thing that we kind of forget because, like, I'm watching The Omen, a much higher budget movie. Yes. But... <laughs> There's a lot of similarities in, like, the way they're filmed and stuff where it's, like... Yes, there is. It's that era of just how everything was made. I also think, though, that the success The Wicker Man had did influence others into, like, encouraging this filming style. Mm -hmm. Because there was some concern, like, oh, this is low budget. It doesn't... It's not coming from someone that we know has done work that we like and is going to sell before Mm -hmm. a lot of your actors are not necessarily the sort of actors we would fill for this sort of role i mean at this point christopher lee's best known role was frankenstein and dracula Dracula. yeah yeah well he was he was the monster in like the newest frankenstein right after this okay well i was also just thinking i i I watched a set of hammer horror films last year he's like dracula seven times in a row yeah (laughs) which is why that one stands out well, the one that I was thinking that stands out, Christopher Lee does yellow face in yes, one of he the does. movies. Yeah. Yes, he does. He was dedicated <laughs> to the cause, and this was an earlier time, and also the man could kill you, so, like, he will yeah. get a pass. He's the only person. Maybe. Yeah, for Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, he did a lot of drugs during that pass. <laughs> yeah, or also uh, Tropic Thunder. <laughs> yeah, God, so it's the only time it turned out good, so too. Good. <laughs> it's the only time it turned out good. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's upsetting. That, that uh, yeah, it's upsetting. That it was so good. <laughs> yeah, but yes. But from from here, I just want to say, I love these shots. I, I always too. love seeing overfly shots of or flyover shots of Scotland. Beautiful country. I also think that unlike a lot of flyover shots, where it's like mostly just an excuse to roll credits and not like waste dialogue or mm-hmm. like pay actor time on screen, I think this is one of the few times where like story and pacing wise, these make sense. Because we are going from his ru- very routine life of, like, mm-hmm. wake up, go to work, go to church, go home. Very gently high-five girlfriend sort of thing. Yeah, his girlfriend <laughs> has, like, one scene in this She's movie. She's, like, barely in this movie. <laughs> just kind of like his life. Um, but we are, we are, he and the audience are getting a chance to sit and think about what we are going to do. Yes, but what it also does, too... Is it helps build the space between, uh, I think he's set, I think he's stationed in Edinburgh. It's some actually big city. Yeah. As opposed to like a small town. Or Glasgow. He, so, so, one of the, like one of the three big one cities. One of the big towns. <laughs> but it's also used to give space between the big city and where he's going because we do quickly get to a bountiful summer isle. Yes. Which it's beautiful. The, someone from the, uh, so, so, something from the IGN film editor. I forgot to write their name down. Uh, they mentioned that the people in this land exist in their own universe, but they're both timeless and also people out of place. Yes, which I think they nail really well because they they do not have the oddness mm-hmm. that I think a lot of modern uh, writers, especially horror writers, go ahead and add on. To, like, the weird small town. Yeah. Children of the Corn, I think, did this a little bit too hard, where it's like, oh, we meet the one guy or the, like, the passerbys who warn you of the town, and they're already, like, super weird. Mm -hmm. These people are not weird in the, like, oh, spooky way. 
They're weird in the like, oh, you live on a little island and you know a grand total of 20 people. Yeah, the gas station attendant or someone, any generic wrong turn movie. Exactly. I do like the play on that in Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. I do too. <laughs> uh, but from here we also get our first song, which is about a harvest. And this song is weird compared to the rest of the movie. Yeah. Because it's happening over the action, but we don't ever see like the people who are participating in the music. It's just the one song of the entire movie that's played over everything. Yes. And this movie, un- whether or not you like it is besides the point. Because unlike a lot of musical movies where the music is produced separately and then mm-hmm. added on. Or even movies where like the film is produced and then they're like, hey, we have these shots coming up. Can you make songs for those? This one instead, they went together mm-hmm. and tried to produce these things side by side, Well, and which on, was for a budget this small. Well, and on top of that, the soundtrack is integral to the movie. Yes, I mean, the songs, and like they meant it to be. Yeah, exactly. And I have, I have something written down a little bit later on that. We get our first like little mini conflict on the landing where he's not being ding- dingied to the island where he's like, but I'm a cop. Well, you need Lord Summer Isle's permission to land here, sir. I do love that because it really just kind of, it it adds a layer of like, not only is he used to being like the goody two shoes, like the most pure character, as Mm -hmm. you said, but he's also used to like cop privileges of like, I park where I want, I get first dibs, I probably get a little bit of a discount or a thank you, sir, Mm -hmm. where he goes. Not in this place. They do not care. No, not at all. (laughs) And what's great about it too, though, is... Immediately, we know he's out of place mm-hmm. because there's this, we, we have all the villagers watching, but on top of that, there's a dude riding a horse through yeah. the village and it's just unsettling and feels foreign and just shows how out of place how he is in a tight knit community. Like, like to the point of like, he, he probably didn't fully realize that like horse was a legit mode of transportation here. Yeah, that's what they use in the olden days. That's what they use in the Amish country. (laughs) Yeah. I wonder if the UK has their own version of the Amish. I don't know. A lot of them came from that area originally, but they left for several reasons. I thought they came mainly from, like, Germany and the Netherlands. There are different groups depending on who you talk to. Okay. They are not all the same. (laughs) Dutch, that's the one I'm thinking of. Yes. The Dutch ones are, I think, much more direct, you can point. Okay. But I only know a handful of them, so, like, I don't know. I haven't gotten to talk to them all. I don't think I've ever met an Amish person. They make some good food, and they are very funny. At least, again, the three that I know. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But once he has finally dingied on, uh, he's asking about this missing girl, uh, Rowan, and I like how he immediately jumps on the case. Yeah, I mean that's like his the whole large point. city cop that he is. Well, he doesn't want to be. He obviously doesn't want to be there. He's no, just, he really doesn't. He's only there out of duty. Um, <laughs> duty. <laughs> but everyone doesn't. No, no one knows who Rowan is. But they know Rowan's mom through a last name. Yes, which you know that's not suspicious at all. Yeah, and now he's off to Maze. Which this is okay. Sorry, I got it a little bit out of myself. This is the mm-hmm. part where there's the music. It's still an awkward music spot, though. Yeah. But, like, it's, I think, again, because all of the music is incredibly intentional, down to whether or not there would be singing, um, and, like, even, like, what the lyrics would be, I think it's intentionally meant to be off-putting. Yeah. Well, I don't even know if a, it's, it's, it's not off-putting in the way I think we would expect it to be in a modern horror film. No, it doesn't feel horror. It just feels almost like... He has stepped out of black and white Kansas and is now in bright, colorful Oz. He's a cop who listens to classical, uh, like Mozart and shit. He definitely and now doesn't we have listen folk to music. Yeah, I don't know. I I think how he wouldn't even how he is one of those people who only listens to religious music. Yes. Yeah. A hundred and ten percent. But also, uh, just a little bit of trivia on this. All the uh, extras were locals and were down to be part of this movie. Which so. I fucking love. That's my favorite thing, especially in a horror film. Oh, yeah. Because not only are they down, but they know it's a horror film and they are ready for it. Mm-hmm. And they, they just do a good job of just, like, being background nosy I No, I think, I think hiring actual nosy neighbor people... To play background nosy people is better than trying to hire people who regularly are trying to be extras and have spent their entire life 
as like quick hire hands mm-hmm. on films of being like, don't look at the camera, do your bit, walk on the line. These people do not have a bit. These people do not have a line to walk. They are legit walking from their house and they were like, hey, on this day, could you maybe like hang around outside? And they're like, I already hang around outside. Yeah. <laughs> No, <laughs> you're you got you got a bunch of people we don't know. We'll be there. Yeah, exactly. Um, but we do get to the sweet shop where all the sweets are skulls, toads, turtles, and one really creepy humanish sweet. Yeah, which violently reminds me of my own child childhood, and now I have questions for my own family. Yes, as well as we're corrected that the, the, the everything else is not rabbits but hares, which is a difference. Mm-hmm. Though I I don't know if the film necessarily explains it entirely but if you are really into old-timey stuff there that will make sense to you yeah so for those who don't know this is one of the little bits of lore i do know hares are supposed to be the spiritual are they're supposed to be spiritual creatures and they're connected to the other world that's why they're kind of like sacred animals a little bit a little bit but not but not like to the point where we uh what we think of sacred they're just Special magical creatures, kind of. And a huge part of that is hares are generally thought of, and if you're talking scientifically, they are the wild, gangly things that hop around, usually fighters, usually much longer, taller, and they look like they could kick something's ass. Whereas a rabbit is usually something that you cultivate, keep in a cage, it's cute, fluffy, mostly there for the pelt. Tasty. Hares, not so tasty. Mostly foot. Still need to try rabbit sometime. It's good. Don't eat mine, but I'm not they gonna, are good. <laughs> I'm not going to eat your rabbit. The only I have I'd, to defend him. <laughs> Andre would have been delicious. Andre would have been delicious. He was a very lazy boy. He was a meat rabbit. <laughs> he was, in fact, a meat rabbit. This one's not. This one's a ditch rabbit that I think is a pet. <laughs> a ditch rabbit? Yeah, a friend found him in a ditch, and he's like, I don't think this one goes in the wild. Do you want him? What? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know that's how you got your rabbit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. But... Back to the wicker man. Um, all the locations were clo- chosen carefully, so that way they felt like it was one big city, even though there was 25 locations. Mm-hmm. Um, also, there is a map where you can go and visit all the locations if you want to. And Oh, that's nice. If I ever go to Scotland again, you know what I'm doing for a little bit of that. You should force your family to go with you. That would be on brand for this movie. I think my family wants to go to Barcelona before Scotland again. Barcelona. It is beautiful there. I understand their desire. Well, we just never went and we're all interested in the Sagrada di Familia. Same. A hundred, yeah, yeah, same. <laughs> That's the only reason they want to go. <laughs> well, I mean, there's more stuff architecturally yeah, there for I'm, you to go see. Yeah, exactly. I want to see Caltrava and shit, Oh, yeah. So. There's like five or six different apartments, houses, and hotels that I want to see there. Yeah, or uh, uh, Gaudi. Mm. Gaudi. Ooh, that would be a good one to pair with, having my family watch. Uh, there was a Japanese film called Antoni Gaudi. And basically, it's this director's uh, vacation footage is what it feels like. You know what? But I would watch the hell out of that. It's kind of mesmerizing. The, 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 this dude made like three or four or five like fantastic films and then left the industry for 20 years. You were good for him. No, he went to do a flower shop. But he made some really fucking good movies, though. But you know what? That's what that's what I want. I want my director to be like, this is my side passion and now I'm going to go run a floral. I don't know. I'm a little. I'm a little <laughs> pissed off. Are you mad that he didn't make more? Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm also pissed off that most of them you can't find right now. So. Well, if they'll come back around. I'm sure they'll be in somebody's attic. Eh, yeah, but anywho. But now it's time to talk to May. Uh, Rowan's not missing, but he's also told that she's a hare, which to him makes no goddamn sense. Yes, and also if you've been paying attention to this point. All the characters have plants or month names. At least the villagers do. Yes, everyone who is actively part of this group Mm -hmm. is named after something from nature. Yeah, and he even finds out about the uh, hair through a little girl painting a hair. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit like... It's a bit like if modern horror film was like, oh, she's a butterfly now. The average listener would be like, oh, she dead. She is dead. Beautiful butterfly. Well, especially for the South, the idea of symbolism of, like, a butterfly after death is very common. Hmm. So, like, the idea of, like, oh, if you see a beautiful butterfly, that's grandma. Swat grandma out, out You of could. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> but, like, this is the same sort of logic leap that I think 
the writer is hoping that not all, but some of the audience will make Mm -hmm. is like from the get go. Oh, oh, she's dead, dead. Yeah. And they're trying to cover it up. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And from here, he's off to the Green Man in for supper, which... I love that they call it the Green Man, because in my head, I only picture the Jolly Green Giant from the Frozen section. Mm. And that's honestly not incorrect in imagery. No. A giant green bean man wearing leaves? Like, that would fit in this movie. Yeah, and actually... So a little on the Green Man himself. Yes. Um, using the quest for the Green Man by John Matthews as a reference is one of the oldest figures in human history. Of course it uh, is. It predates written text and represents a, the generative power of the universe, mm-hmm. uh, usually depicted as a masculine archetype. Um, it's also counter to the uh, feminine green woman, flower brides, or spring maidens, which we do see some of this a little bit later, too. Of course. Um, it's used to represent the cycle of life and death, which is... Fitting for the movie, but a bit deeper study that we can't really go into as the archetype is so ancient, it appears as a character in the Epic of Gilgamesh. For those who don't know, that is the oldest story we know to exist in written (laughs) form. This is how ancient the Green Man is. But he also symbolizes canned corn. Yeah, (laughs) and he shows up in the Arthurian movie, which the Green Man movie is. Yes. Yeah. I hate that you... Is Green Giant even still a brand? Yeah, Jolly Green Giant? Of fucking course he is! Look at that man. Look at look at his giant statue in Minnesota. What is it with you and finding weird-ass statues? Look, when you're born and raised in the Midwest and this is what your vacations are for family, this is what you know. He's even got a fucking Pop Fuko. Of course he does. He's famous! The fuck is this shit? Look at the giant green man. Look how tiny you could be next to him. Is he wearing underwear underneath that? Uh, it's unclear. <laughs> See his green bean. <laughs> 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 uh, but enough of that stupid vegetable. Look at the lifelike man in his advertisement days. No. Makes you uncomfortable. No, we're, we're back to the whip <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Uh, but the one thing I do like about, uh, this part too is there's this aspect of Howie always being watched. Oh, yeah. Like, even when he thinks he is, like, being left alone, someone in the background is, like, craning in the neck to see what he's doing. hmm Yeah, no, exactly. His literal ever, every breath is being observed. Yep. And this is where we're introduced to Willow. Um, and to bring up, we haven't talked about the characters a whole lot, but I think it's interesting of... Despite Christopher Lee being a big name, uh, Britt Eklund was suggested by the studio for rain ne- rain, ne- ne- name recognition. Yeah. And is actually Swedish and had a heavy accent, and they were very worried about having to dub <laughs> over her. Yeah. She didn't have to. That I mean, she's one of the few. Yeah. She doesn't <laughs> sing in this movie, though. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we also get the next song about loving the landlord's daughter, uh, which... It feels very shanty esque. Like it yeah. feels very like this is the p- local pub song that they've been singing for generations, yeah. regardless of whether the landlord's daughter's pretty or not. Uh, yeah. In fact, it might be funnier if she's not. <laughs> yeah, but it's also used as a way to show that everyone around him is everyone's livelier around him than Howie himself. And also, like Howie's stick is so far up his ass that he cannot possibly comprehend the fun and joy of this song. Yeah, he doesn't like the innuendos of, like, the path between the left toe and the right toe. Yeah, like, he is so uncomfortable by the idea of people holding hands, let alone a full song about uh, banging this random woman. Landlord's daughter. Yeah. <laughs> And it also just, he's also a buzzkill because he like stops this song to ask everyone of like, have you seen this girl? Oh, and not even like a, oh, well, I've got everyone's attention. It's more of like a, I can't take the embarrassment anymore. Yeah, just like, I'm I'm uncomfortable. I'm going to make you feel uncomfortable. Howie also feels very much like the sort of guy who thinks he is being subtle, but is very used to being the center of all attention all the time. Yeah. And he finally is actually the center of all attention almost all the time. And now he doesn't like it. <laughs> and doesn't kind of realize that he's the center of attention half the time. No. Yeah. Not in the same way that he would like. Because yeah, he's immediately back to work as he reviews the uh, Harvest Festival photos and interviewing everyone. And 
He's um, not even being very like subtle or professional here. He's no. just like walking around, and be like, "Have you? Have you seen her? Have you seen her? Where'd this picture go?" Howie is simultaneously, I'm sure, in whatever city he's from. He's a solid cop. He also seems to be the cop that goes out to the remote areas. He, he looks to me like a cop who he thinks is a very good cop, but the only reason that he has ever gotten a promotion is because he has kissed some ass. That or, but, yeah. This that. is part of the ass kissing. True. <laughs> to a bunch of people who don't do that shit for her. Yes. <laughs> but at the same time, out of his element, Howie is the absolute worst fucking cop to walk this earth. He is... A terrible cop. Yeah. An absolute garbage cop. Yeah. If He's not a detective. And so the fact that they have sent him, who is pretty much qualified to maybe hand out some parking tickets. No, he's he's uh, he's an investigator. They Okay, they call him investigator. I do not believe Howie has investigated jack shit in his whole life. <laughs> I think Howie is the sort of investigator who has walked in, gotten a vibe from someone, and been like, that man sins. It's him. Howie, <laughs> Howie feels like an old movie cop. Yes. Which, but, but like, kind of works. Because Howie, yeah. Howie feels not only to be in the wrong place, but, like, the wrong movie. Yeah, no, in any other movie before this, he would have lived. Oh, he oh, would have... Oh, shot... Spoiler, but... Oh, well, okay. I mean, we're spoiler for this movie? Come on. We're doing a deep dive on it, so... Yeah. Yeah, but... Oh, no, one of the photos is missing. I also love that uh, the man who tells Howie that the photo broke, and that's why it's missing, is lying, and it's the worst lie I've ever seen anyone tell. <laughs> but it's great. It's back at the shop. It's broken. <laughs> I mean, th that's the other thing, too, is, like, a lot of this feels like Scooby-Doo logic in a way. No, the whole thing is Scooby-Doo logic. Unfortunately, though, Howie is the only one playing by Scooby-Doo rules. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's also just this set of, like, false clues, the constant focus on him and the clues. He also, like, again, is the worst police detective on this planet mm -hmm. that, like, he thinks that he is following these breadcrumb trails, right? Yeah. And he isn't completely missing the obvious signs around him. No. Well, like, dude, have you not taken any cues from anyone around you yet? No, not at all. Because, I mean, that leads into, like, he, he sits down to have a meal. He complains about it because it's grody. Which, okay, excuse fucking you, sir, that meal looked just fine minus the off color. The turquoise beans. Okay, the rest of the meal, yeah, plain, but looks fine. You mean a Scotsman was pissed off about a meal in a land where they boil and don't season their sh they I'm making a joke. I know I, the no, Scottish season their But at their the food. same time, at the same time, this meal is perfectly fine. Eat your goddamn food, you little prick. Yeah. Like, this is like the backwater town. You're lucky they serve food at all. Yeah, just a yeah, just a bit. Like the town my grandpa grew up in, a like grand total of like maybe five hundred people. The local watering hole did not serve food. They served bags of chips that they bought from Costco two towns up. Huh. That was your food. Eat it. Fascinating. <laughs> and they thought it was great. <laughs> because they're not there for food. They're there to like have a drink, talk to the friends, yeah. play a game of darts. And this man is here like, I request Food not from a can. To be fair, this is an inn. Yeah, well, but like an inn to who? Yeah, no, that's exact. I was just thinking that too. Is like nobody visits here, or they're not allowed without Summer Isle's permission. Yeah, this nobody fucking visits here. Howie's a fucking awful cop. We are <laughs> doing better at investigating this shit than he is. Yeah, but actually, <laughs> but on top of that, this this meal starts like this trend of. So Willow says this thing that ever sometimes things are much uh the natural state has more vivid colors. Yes. And this begins the sexually charged dialogue that is through this entire movie that's almost a tad uncomfortable. Yes. Like I I mean it's not terrible but you know you're you're kind of squeaming a little bit for Howie himself, because you, well... This is like how an embarrassment is real. And it's also kind of going over his head, too, because you know it she's really talking is. about her pussy. No, a hundred percent. Howie is missing all of the hints that yeah. this woman is hitting on him. Oh, yeah. No, exactly. He has no fucking clue. He's just upset these beans came from a tin and that they've 
quote unquote gone off. Yeah. And, and that he can't have an apple for dessert. Oh no, exactly. And like her her response is food isn't everything in life, right? And like winks at him and like shimmies her cute shoulders away and how he's like fucking mashed potatoes. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, to be fair, he's a stout man who has a fiance back home. A fiance who he has seen twice. And we've seen once in the movie. He's seen her ankles. <laughs> <laughs> like how we get get it together, my man. You work in the police force. Uh, like surely you've overheard men talk before, right? Have you just been living behind your desk? Howie's only exclusively sent to the far end. This might be why Howie is sent to the far ends is because he's so insufferable. <laughs> I would not doubt this it. This is also probably why Howie doesn't have a partner. Because like during this time period, would it not have been like a standard cop show, like? trope to have a partner or like a young per- a young cop that's stuck with you i don't think we've hit the buddy cop comedy yet well not, not comedy i'm just talking like during the like detective phase there was always the hardened cop who i don't need a partner and that was like oh my god he doesn't have a partner yeah i think i think we do have some of that i grant i'm not super versed in cop movies so I know it was a big trope for radio around this time, but, like, I don't know if that translated to movies quite the okay. same. I mean, if he's a remote one, they're probably just sending one dude. He's in, like, a little pontoon plane that obviously only holds him. That's true. So <laughs> That's how... true. They might have only had one plane ticket. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but how he is in for a cultural shock as he walks out to a lawn orgy. Uh, yeah. Poor Howie. Yeah. I like I like that this movie does a great job of trying to even though they knew that most of their audience while being able to relate to Howie and probably empathize with him quite a bit would not take Howie's approach. Like that would not have been the main audience even during the time. Mm-hmm. But by just kind of being like and boom, lawn orgy, it automatically like helps the audience be like, oh, poor Howie. Yeah, well, and you gotta think about, like, maybe for the 70s, this is, like, really shocking, so, like... Yeah. Shocking enough for, like... It would have been shocking enough to, like, put people in the same shoes mm-hmm. as Howie again, because, like... For like, a good Christian Midwest audience. Even, I think even just, like, the general audience would have mm-hmm. been, like, not necessarily, like, oh my god, I've never even seen or heard of an orgy before, but, like... Enough to be like, oh, we're showing that on screen? Yeah, we're, we're out of the sexual revolution of the 60s, so we're... Yeah, it's not like half of the audience hasn't at least heard about, like, one. Mm-hmm. But it would have been enough to, like, shock people into being more on Howie's side, as opposed to realizing how stupid Howie is. Oh, yeah. And there's a part in this movie... This is the one part in the movie, or one of the parts in the movie, where there's an odd choice to, like, use in slow-mo, do a little bit of a pause, specifically on a topless woman... Which... Yeah, okay. For this movie's um, defense, the emphasis on the naked body mm-hmm. is done such in a way that, like, it is both artistic and also awkward. And I yeah. think that hits the point. Exactly. Because while I was thinking about that, it's really that kind of shock because the movie is still heavily from Howie's point of view. So yes. he's coming out of an inn for a nightly stroll and boom. Howie has probably never seen tits before. Uh, religious he, paintings? Eh, I don't know of how, like, I don't know how much tit Howie would have ever seen, especially on a real human. True. True. Yeah. So, like, this very much also tracks with, like, just Howie's own line of vision of being like, I can't stop looking. Howie feels like one of those guys who was an absolute horrid dude in high school. Yes. But turned his life around and just became this devout, unrelenting Christian. Howie thinks he had a whore phase in high school, but his whore phase was like having one naughty magazine. I don't know. And like that turned, that quote unquote turned his life around. That's who Howie is. And then he's going to preach about it later to his friends. It's like those old pot commercials. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did pot once. <laughs> and I killed my friend! <laughs> and, like, none of that actually happened, Howie. You were just in the car with someone who had pot in their pocket. Calm down. Howie definitely watched Reefer Madness. <laughs> oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> and he took it very literally. Yeah. Because, I mean, there, there's a part, too, where, like, he witnesses a woman on a gravestone naked and crying, and he's just absolutely horrified. Yeah, which, like, Howie, be nice. She's sad. 
But how can you be nice when she is showing more than an ankle? Come on, Howie. Sad people do crazy <laughs> things. Let her cry. <laughs> uh, and from here, Howie goes back to the end. Off to bed horrified. Um, I love how, like, quickly, too, he, like, shuffles. Mm-hmm. Also of note, uh, the music that's happening here, uh, the person singing is also the composer. And while we're on him, I'd like to bring up the music. Yes. So this movie is composed by Paul Giovanni, who Mm -hmm. this is his only film credit. Yes. He's never Mm -hmm. composed for another movie after this or before this. And honestly, just credits in general, I could not find anything on this man. No, he's got like he's got like I a couple find, solo. Things. I found a single recording of a different solo, and that was it. Mm-hmm. Like, dude did this movie and then like, vanished. Yeah. Um, also, apparently, he couldn't read music, but he knew how to be precise and intentional, and that's why the music hit so hard and so well in this movie. Have you ever seen the Music Man? No. We're going to have to go over that one because of this man. <sighs> that is the entire, like, premise of that musical. Wait, wait. The music. The- no, I have. Yes, I have. The- I, I, I was a stage crew on that, and that's how I met the only girlfriend I've had, so. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I, then, I do know, the, I do you know, know of the music man. Okay. Yes, I do know the music man. You gotta, yeah, play by intuition. Yes. Um... But also the way this everything's sung, it's done in a half voice, which makes me think a lot of like the singing in Lord of the Rings, yeah. especially like a Pippin song. And all of that was based off of old, especially English folk songs. Yes. So like that tracks. Yeah. It's an odd combination of folk with like a little bit of rock here and there because there is like one weird rock track. Okay. Part of the reason why I think you pick up on the rock more than maybe the like average movie watcher picks up on is because the underlying tones especially for old folk mm. match up really well with rock which ha- like you are not the only one who noticed that because this movie soundtrack has been rewritten by no less than 12 rock bands oh really there's been like especially willow's song that one specifically, like, a ton of bands have gone back through and made metal versions and rock versions and heavy rock versions. I wonder why that scene in particular. <laughs> yeah, that scene in particular. <laughs> but, like, this music, like, people people saw this movie, loved it, heard the music, and remembered it. Which is very impressive for a man who did, as far as I can find, just this. Yeah, pretty much. So, how he's winding down for the night. And there's someone at the window asking uh, Willow to deflower a boy. Okay. And, yeah. oh, Howie is clutching his pearls. Also, his, his poor little Christian heart cannot. Yeah. What? Okay, so here here's some things about this. Okay. So he obviously can hear this. They're all talking loud enough because he's also bringing up, be ready for the day of death and rebirth. Which which sounds ominous and scary and spooky, and I love. Oh, it sounds cool as shit. I mean, it sounds so dope. It's all it's it's a it's a cooler way of like saying Easter. Yes. Yeah. The day no, of death and rebirth. It's a hundred percent way cooler like version of being like, are you ready for the equinox or solstice? Yeah. Which ah uh, fuck I. Sugi's an asshole. He. <laughs> I have recently watched Cats. Uh, Speci- specify which version, please. The one that I wish they had buttholes because it'd be more interesting than the rest of the movie. For those who would like buttholes on all of the versions, <laughs> that would be the newest uh, <laughs> CGI version. Um, yeah, so it also kind of like makes me think of that a little bit because uh-huh. a lot of people, like, I brought up, I mentioned to some friends that I was being forced to watch it, mm-hmm, and... Mm-hmm. I brought up, like, how there's... I know there's occult stuff in Cats. There is definitely cult stuff in Cats. And they're like, cats. I don't remember that. It's like, dude, like, one of the first, like, three songs... No. ...is about the name you... The name people give you, the name you tell other people, and then the name you keep to yourself, your magical name that you don't give to anyone else because that gives them control over you. Literally the only plot point... Li- literally the only plot point in Cats is that the one old magic cat is going to pick a cat... For them to go to the heavy side. 
Heavy sigh makes me think of something else, but I'll explain that later. I, okay. Well, in the mo- in the play, it is. Some people like to think it's heaven. Some people like to think it is rebirth. I personally like to think it is finally fucking death because these things have nine lives and they don't fucking die. Get reborn. It's the cats it could are, be reborn. The cats yes. are like fucking Doctor Who. Yeah, it could be. Like one cat Death and reborn. You've got nine lives. Yeah, literally the only plot point in the entire musical cats. As someone who has watched the musical cats a lot. Like it was one of my favorites as a child. Brian's informed me. Yeah, it was highly one of my favorites as a child. <laughs> I was a very strange child. Arguably strange still. But like that is literally the only plot point. Is is a group of cats arguing on who should be the coolest cat who gets to go and get reborn. This year's cat Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's not even like, oh, who's the oldest? Because that one crusty old lady has been the oldest for a while. Yeah. And, like, we only picked her because we felt sorry this year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's the only plot point. It's another d- movie for another day. Oh, when we get to Cats, I'm gonna be fucking ready, my dude. I have the original uh, book of poems. I don't want to talk about Cats okay. right now. <laughs> But now it's time for another round of Gently Johnly. Johnny. Ah, uh, yes. There's... And Howie is so... Obviously not comfortable with it. Because there's also the line of, mm-hmm. like, do you want to fill me? Like, there's a lot of stuff Howie's not cool with. Cause there's a lot of stuff Howie has not even allowed himself to contemplate. No. Because out, outside, mysterious window dude who delivers children to be deflowered is now watching Snail Screw and... Criticizing humans, especially the religious types like Howie. Yeah. And, like, I appreciate that some of this conversation seems to be done specifically for Howie's uncomfortableness. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing. So, I think... Shocker, this is Lord Summer Isle. Um, I like this part, too, is... What it does is it sets up the animosity towards Howie Mm -hmm. without finding out who this guy is initially. Yes, that is true. It's also, like, just their way of, like, even further, like, starting to bring those contrasting ideas together, but not fully clashing just yet. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which, I, the scene is weird, too, because, well, I like the ceiling painting. I think it's pretty cool for, like, the symbol of death and rebirth of their culture. Sure, like, it's nice, yeah. This is, like, an attraction for, like, all the people of the inn, because they're, like, listening up there of, like, Oh, Seamus lasted four seconds longer than you! <laughs> yeah, no, this poor child is being absolutely torn to shreds. Yeah, because it's, like, a weird, like, it's essential. It's like a passage, like, a rite of passage in a way. Yeah, you fuck the landlord's daughter. It, it's, it's, like, a literal, like, hey, no, no, we took the song literally. Yeah. No, we've all done it. We, we've all been there. Yes. Her mother did it, and her daughter will do it, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But it's also, like, a weirdly, like, sensual scene of, like, because Howie is, Howie is a horn dog. But he, partially because Howie's not allowed to even look at his own ankles. <laughs> Howie out here with an ankle fetish. <laughs> I wouldn't put it past the man. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's it, it's a good scene though. It is a good scene. Yeah, and from here we we'll move on to Maple Time as uh, Howie heads to the school, which I they do a good job of making sure that Howie is clearly fascinated with Willow. Yes. Uh, and there's also like she's the, she basically sits there as this constantly passive taunting temptation. Yes, and it's almost like both she and everyone in the town are like so. Do you want to see how long the new guy can last? Yeah, exactly. When he's basically, it's being thrust in his face of like, hey, Howie, if you want. Yeah, like, no one will say no. Yeah. And also, like, as he's going to the Maple, he is absolutely confused by this so- oh, somehow. Yeah. I don't know why he's still confused. He's had some time to think about this town. Mm-hmm. And yet Howie doesn't seem to do much thinking. No. Because he is still shocked and surprised to see naked people. Yeah. And I think there's this interesting division of the genders at this scene, too, where the girls, the way they're... Because ex- this is their sex ed class, basically. Yeah, it's terrible sex ed class, but, like, okay. I mean, they're they're explaining it, basically. Eh, you- there's some... There's some things to be desired, but okay. It's uh, better than how we got. It's explaining how reproduction works. Yeah. Yeah. There should be more to a sex ed class than that. 
Yeah. Well, but this is more than how we got. <laughs> and it's it's weird, too, because, like, the girls talking of it is very clinical and studious. While the boys is just, like, this weird giant circling of a giant dick. It almost... Yes. It is worship of the giant dick. It's almost... It's a frat. Sing, it's a singular circle jerk. It is frat boyish. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Which... I also like this, uh, once Howie gets into the school, he's like, what the fuck is this shit? And they're like, do not question our small town school. We do not question your big city school. Yeah. And they're just all fucking around with him because he's like, well, he's I He's also clearly to- not the first person to be like, hey, the fuck y'all doing? Yeah. Well, he's like, I got to see the list of students here. You have to get permission from Lord Summer Isle. Mm-hmm. And so he's, he's going through all this shit. And then he's like, oh, Rowan. You guys lied. You are all a bunch of little liars. You're going to hell. And they're like, I don't fucking care, you weird man. Yeah, because he goes to the desk and there's a beetle, like, walking in circles tied to a nail, which is very representational and Howie doesn't know it. Yeah, again, Howie's really dumb for a detective. Or inspector, excuse me. He at least at some point understands Willow wants to bang him. It takes him a hot minute, though. Like, a long, a uncomfortably long time. Yeah. Like, Willow has clearly sat down at some point during this movie and been like, do I need to just come out and ask the man? <laughs> he doesn't seem to be taking flirtation well. No, not at all. And, I mean, it's just, it's another way to screw with him. Oh, yeah. No, you know, for sure. And we got a little bit of music, and this lyric is a adaptation of some song based off a Scottish R, or Errors, I think is what they called it. Mm-hmm. I wrote it down, and I couldn't find the actual name of what it's, it's supposed one, to be. It's one of those songs that, like, depending on where you are, there's a couple variations of it. Okay. It's something that you, nobody really necessarily, like, writes down, kind of like Wheels on the Bus. It's just everyone knows it. Oh, okay. Like, every, like, it's not Wheels on the Bus. It's not for, like, that level of children. But, like, it's in the same way of, like, no one is out here writing the score to Wheels on the Bus. People just know it. I bet there is a score out there for it. There is now, because we live in the craziest of timelines. Mm. But, like, back in back in the day, people just sang it. You just knew it. Interesting. But Howie finally has direction, uh, and he's... Uh, where is he heading on this? Oh, he's, he's heading to the gravesite. Yes. Uh, and to be fair... The fact it took him this long to figure out this girl's dead is upsetting. And from also, like, from their point of view, like... They did tell him. Yeah. And also, like, they're not lying. Like, from their point of view, they're speaking the truth. Yeah. Like, by their religion, she is a hare somewhere. But it doesn't fit Howie's definition of truth. Which we will talk about more later throughout this movie. Yeah, (laughs) because he's walking along and he just sees some coffin and he puts a crucifix over it all also while at the same time there's a lot of of this too there's a woman breastfeeding a baby juxtaposing life and death yeah and also like this town is very not upset by death it is like they are very into the whole like life cycle kumbaya Mm -hmm. sort of thing howie is very uncomfortable not only by the like creation of life but by like the sustaining of child breastfeeding Mm -hmm. like Howie is definitely one of those people who would be upset by someone breastfeeding in a restaurant. And also how he's upset by the idea of death. Howie's seen more titties in the last 24 hours than he will see in his entire life. Probably, yeah. <laughs> and that includes his own fiance wife. Yes. Uh, but we also get like a little bit of... We find out that this town used to be a little bit Christian, or they used to have a church that used to be Christian. Uh, with the groundskeeper, he's like, well, where's your... Uh, Pa- pastor? I, I don't know. I don't remember. One, one of the higher-ups, he's like, oh, we don't have one anymore. Well, what about your church? He's like, it's not a church anymore. Yeah, you know, this, you know we, we've got one if you want it. Yeah. And they're also screwing with him, too, because he finds Rowan's grave, and she's not a hare because there's her navel skin's on the tree. Yeah, but also, like, again, this is how he being purposefully obtuse. Mm-hmm. Like, a a man with a little bit more flexibility in his mindset would be able to put two and two together by now and would have probably fucking returned back and been like, she's dead. Yeah. Someone sent a prank postcard. Yeah. Like, uh, she's dead. I don't know what to tell you. The rest of the town seems fine. Like, but no. Mm, his, no, the rest of the town's not fine according, according to Howie. But again, according to Howie. Yeah. So, like, th- this is where... 
we really get to see how little Howie's flexibility in mm-hmm. both his like thinking process and also in his his version of morality yeah is about to just absolutely fuck him up the ass oh no exactly and i i like that when we're talking about this i think it's interesting that he goes from or the town itself goes from this point of the first day he's there they're kind of on their best behavior yeah and just the insanity for him just Keeps getting ramped up because he immediately goes back to the candy shop to confront May, and he's like, and he sees her treating a little girl with a, a sore throat with a toad. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And now it's time for him. He's like, okay, this is barbaric. You're a liar. I know your daughter's alive. Why are you hiding her? If you're a horrible mother, basically. And from here, he, he goes back to the uh, uh, city records. Where everyone is now being stubborn, like, you'll have to get Lord Summer Isle's permission. Which, also, I appreciate that the town at this point has still not actually lied to him by their own standards. And they have also told him the quickest way to solve this case. Mm -hmm. Go talk to Lord Summer Isle. No. They have told him multiple times, like, oh, you want that information? You need to go talk to this guy. You would like to go here? You need to go talk to this guy. Like, he is Lord. You need to go talk to this guy. And he's just like, no, I'm a cop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, he, he bullies his way into it. He finds out that, uh, uh, I think it's Roman's grandparents were named Benjamin and Rachel, which they, they explain off. This is the first biblical names we've had in the movie from the town. Yes. And the explanation is like, they were very old. They were very old. Yeah. <laughs> And now we're now we're it's very well aware that Rowan is known by people. He just has to find Rowan. Yes. Which, Again, they've told him how to find Rowan. Yeah, which he goes mm-hmm. on to the developer who has no copies or leads for him. Good for this man. <laughs> and now he's off now he's finally off to Lord Summer Isle as he walks by or is carted off by uh some phallic shrubs. I love the phallic shrubs. Someone's that is someone's art right there. Yeah, it makes me think of the uh, Yonic shrubs and uh, what we do in the shadows. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and now we have a little bit of time for a uh, naked hedge dancing and some prego women walking through the orchards. I think this scene here is like mostly to help the audience catch up to uh, Howie's level of like deep dive that he's just had Mm -hmm. whereas like technically none of this is like wrong by their standards but this is something that like especially for this time in movie you probably wouldn't have seen especially the like pregnant ladies Mm -hmm. on screen like this would have been enough of a shock to be like oh yeah i am here for a horror film this maybe isn't necessarily horror yet but this is shocking a little bit yeah for a standard audience in the 70s like yeah well, and also there's a lot of soft focus on this bit too, which yeah, it is a bit of titties. It, it, yeah, it's a ni- it's a nice artistic titties. touch for female nudity. Also, I appreciate this sort of appreciation of female nudity as opposed to the more modern like we have the one beautiful like backlit sex scene mm-hmm. of like this is the time to appreciate the titties. This I think is a much better way of doing it yeah. because not only do you like get more titties out of the deal. But also, like, this feels like a more, like, everyone is here having a good time, not just, like, oh, I'm now spying on the two main characters banging. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, very, very much so. It's kind of like um, in Before Midnight, where, uh, shoot, what's her name? The French chick in the movie. There's two characters. I can't remember her name. She there's a big scene, there's a big scene where she's talking to her husband. They're kind of having an argument. She's just laying there on her bed with her tits out. As one who is laying on her own bed should do. Yeah. No, it's, it, it just, it fits. But it feels like you're, like, in their bedroom with them. Yeah. In, in a way, too, like, it's not, and I get what you're saying, because it's not a sexualized scene. It's just no, it's naked just, people. It's just titties. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We do. I mean, they're beautiful yeah. and artistic titties. There's an appreciation of the titty, mm-hmm. but it is not, like, invasion of... It is not like how Howie envisions the titty. Yeah. Only for bedtime use. 
I don't I don't even know if Howie would use that for bedtime use. He feels Howie like Howie doesn't seem like he would know what to do with it. Howie TV. feels like one of those guys where like the breast is used for feeding your child. How dare you be attracted to it? Except for me and my wife. She has great tits. But I'm not gonna tell you that. <laughs> Howie very yeah. much feels like the sort of guy who at one point at the like police officers like they're all sitting around the water cooler talking shit, comparing titties, and how he's like, "Yeah, great sandbags, very sperm." Virgin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. Yeah, but now it's time to meet Lord Summer Isle in this fancy ass mansion. And finally, my favorite actor appears, Christopher Lee. Well, no, he you saw him earlier. This is true. He, he has was talking been... about snail fucking. You know. Honestly, a very fascinating thing, and you should be glad I did not go on a tangent. I know about flatworms. Sn- snails so. are an interesting thing, but we we don't have time for it. Yeah, but I do like this mansion. It's really to sh- it does show how decadent and like how there's old artifacts, and it's it's remnant of what Summer Isle used to be. Yes, and Lord Summer Isle himself is intriguing from the get-go because he's talking about how refreshing it is to see the youth dancing and how he is so pissed off at this point yes and he's so hung up on the nakedness he really can't get over it like at all he can't he is like an american going to a french nudist beach he cannot handle no and this is really the first confrontation because um lord summer isle brings up that they're practicing uh, pathogenesis, which is reproduction without sexual union. Um, and Howie is like, how could they? And somewhere I was like, don't, isn't that a big part of your beliefs, dude? Um, that's a bit of a deep dive for Howie. He was not ready for that question. No, and Howie is offended by the comparison. Howie also, I don't think, understood the comparison. No, it <laughs> reminds me of, uh, my girlfriend at the, or old girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Uh, When I compared God to Zeus. You can't do that. That breaks the logic. Oh, yeah, that was a talk. I bet. (laughs) Yeah. But also, like, Lord Summer Isle is rubbing it in Howie's face. Yeah, no, and, like, I appreciate how it is clear to everyone but Howie that that Howie is not the first person from outside this island to come and visit and be, like, shocked by what they see. Howie is just the first one to be this upset and also not fucking leave. Oh, yeah. No, exactly. Like, because Lord Somerset is, like, ready with answers. He is, he's honestly kind of surprised at how he hasn't been to see him sooner. Yeah, no, exactly. He's like, I've been expecting you. Uh, for, like, a couple days, my dude. <laughs> he's like, at least two. This is the second day. Should have landed and been like, take me to your leader. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's kind of like an alien invasion movie a little bit. Yeah, only Howie's the alien and he doesn't understand that. Yeah. No, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but also, like, Lord Summer Isle's a dick about this, too. He's, he I bring... mean, Howie's also being an ass. Yeah. He's not helping the situation. I mean, Lord Summer Isle says, God is dead. He had his chance. Yeah, no, like, Lord Summer Isle is not, like, smoothing anything over for Howie, but also Howie is not helping either. So, like, no. they're having a good back and forth. But I think one is enjoying this conversation more than the other. Summer Isle. Oh, yeah. He's having a great time. And part of the reason these two work so well as characters is that they're unwilling to understand each other at every single encounter. Yes. And we get that in the snail fucking scene from the get-go is that Lord Summer Isle is not going to accept Howie, and we already know he's going to be antagonistic towards him. Yes. But we also learn a little bit of history that in 1868, when the land cha- the land changed because Sor- Summer Isle's uh, grandfather brought the island back to grow success with fruit, with harvest or like sustainable practice, basically. Yes. Ba- basically, bringing uh, plant studies back. Yeah. The like one of the sources like call him an argamist, which is like the science of harvest and growth Mm -hmm. and plants that like you specifically cultivate and like that would check he he is a lord that is a handed down title Mm -hmm. the place is known for apples and fancy fruit and blue beans turquoise turquoise beans i am aware turquoise is green he's a kind of green yeah he's greenish yeah 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 i don't know 
Is yeah. It, yeah, it's close enough. It's close enough. But I also like that Summer Isle still defends himself, too, that he's not an un- unenlightened heathen. He's aware of the ways of Howie. Yeah, and he's like, that's why we're here on this island without you. Yeah, and like the whole time, like he's like, okay, yeah, you can go exhume the grave. And then Howie gets so worked up by everything. I love how Howie thought this man was going to fight him. Yeah. And is upset he's not fighting him. No, and then he's like, are you going to, are you, are you not going to let me exhume the grave? And And he's he's like, like, I thought I gave you that answer. Like the first two sentences I gave to you, dude. You are not listening. We are having different conversations. (laughs) Well, and also like, it shows how much of a game it is to Summer Isle. Yes. Because he brings up that it was a pleasure meeting a Christian copper. Yeah. 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 Also to note, there is these uh, bound wheat threads everywhere. Mm -hmm. I forgot to look up what their meaning are, but... Harvest, bounty. Yeah. I mean, it... It's very literal. You think it... You're you're probably right. Yeah. But now it's time to dig up Rowan, and uh, surprise, it's a hare. Ah! Ha 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 ha! They did tell him. Yeah. He was warned. He's just refusing to listen to anyone here. Yep. And he's back to Summer Isle's mansion, which uh, there's a lady there. I don't even know who this lady is. I don't remember. She's just kind of there singing. Yeah. Oh, is it the school? I think it's the schoolmaster. It might be. I can't remember. She has a bit part. Um, but I just love how. How he just casually tosses a dead hair at them. Yeah. I also appreciate that Howie's, how he clearly is both, he has worked himself up to mm-hmm. such a fit. And also, I think how he keeps doing things expecting a certain reaction. He yes. fights with, Lord, with the Lord expecting a certain reaction, doesn't get it. He talks to the townspeople, doesn't get the reaction. He throws a hair, at, a dead hair at people. And is like, this'll do it. Ah! And like, nothing. They're just like, like, ah, dead hair. Now I gotta bury it again. Oh, no, it's not even that. Lord Summer Isle's response is, little Rowan loved the March hairs. Yeah, like, they are not upset, and Howie can't handle it. Howie is turning very quickly into a Karen. Oh, yeah. Well, and what's great, too, is like, Howie is expecting people to bend to his job. And he's getting pissed off because Lord Summer Isle's constantly comparing their traditions to his. And, like, how he's like, I need answers. And Lord Summer Isle's like, you're supposed to be the detective here. And also, like, we're literally telling you the answers. Yeah. No, exactly. How how he is that medieval superstitious dude of, like, anything not Christian is evil. I mean, we talked about it a little bit. This is not, even, to- not even medieval. Victorian level of, like, if I don't understand it, it is fake and I shall rewrite it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's very similar to like we brought up earlier the satanic panic of yes, the eighties and nineties. This is what fed into it. This rigidity of thinking. Yeah. Only instead of them being on in this movie on like the majority end, how he is the only person on the island who is doing this. Mm-hmm. There's not like a group to like rile each other up with. Yeah. Well, and riled up how he is, he now decides to break into the photography shop. Rude. He ca- probably could have just asked nicely. No, because he goes in at night because he's going to develop the photos because I guess he knows how to develop photos, too. But Howie is fucking nerd enough to definitely know how to develop photos. Oh, yeah. He's a detective. Uh, no, now he's just a nerd. Yeah. Which, he finds out that, oh, the photo's there and there's Rowan. The crops failed. <gasps> oh, my God. Breadcrumbs leading him to a conclusion. Yeah. He could have gotten here a lot fucking sooner with a lot less hurt, but you know what? I'm glad he's finally here. And now he believes that Rowan is not dead. You know what? Again, we could have gotten to this conclusion sooner, but Howie is stupid. Yep. Because after all this, he's exhausted and he goes back to the inn where uh, we have time for another musical scene in The Temptation of Mr. Pure on his second night. (sighs) Poor Howie. Honestly, like, he could have just, like, fallen asleep under a tree somewhere and probably gotten a better night's sleep. Could have also given it into his wills and lived. Yeah, but like that wouldn't have been Howie. No, no. Okay, let's let's be very straightforward. Howie as a cop, he would have gotten himself killed eventually. Mm-hmm. Howie's that bad of a cop. He just chose the more exciting path. 
Yeah, true. And, I mean, this, this seems also a little odd, too, because it's, one, there's, those walls are really thin. Well, um, I mean, it's old-timey. There wasn't the insulation that we have today. True. Um, but also, like, it, it's it's a weird, like, oh, shit, what's, what's, it's like the, uh, I want to say it's like the tell me more scene. Yeah. Where there's, like, the call and response of, like, she's, she's seeing something, she bangs on the wall, how he respond or tries thinks about responding but doesn't. Yes, it, this is arguably the most like standard musically bit mm-hmm. without being too cheesy. Oh yeah, well, and on top of that, it's th- also to uh, bring up Willow is naked. Um, um, Willow might as well have been naked this whole movie. Let's be honest here. Yeah, for like the four scenes she's in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but also in a weird choice, they for the butt scenes, it's not. Eklund. Well, I don't necessarily think it's a weird choice. I think, especially for this time period, being uh, having full nudity scenes wasn't necessarily something that a lot of actresses were very comfortable with. Mm. Having a stunt double come in, especially a stunt double who was an exotic dancer and could dance a little bit better than the actress felt comfortable doing on screen, not necessarily bad. Also remember that like this is before we had the giant cloth that we then cgi out Mm. nowadays to like prevent actors and actresses from having to like actually see each other's junk if they don't want to um this would have not had quite the same luxury still some privacy but not not nearly what we have today so like i can totally understand how an actress would be like look i'm famous for horror movies we're not here just yet Tits, yeah, yeah, my ass. That's for me. Well, I don't. I think they just. I think what the direct or what the crew said is that they just switched it for whatever reason. It wasn't even that she wasn't down for it. It's just they chose someone else because they liked the way their butt looked better or something. I mean, she, she did literally get paid for her butt regularly, so like I understand that. <laughs> that was her job. But also, one thing that's mentioned uh, by the critics was the weaponization of female sexuality in this movie. Yes, but also, like, I think one of the things that gets very overlooked in this movie Mm -hmm. is the, normally, especially in a horror movie that we see um, this much, like, emphasis and power given to women and their sexuality, it is usually paired with a demasculation of the men. Mm -hmm. And in this case, that's not happening. No. If anything, both are being Mm hyper-sexualized, but, like, in their own way well and it works with their culture too because it's it's dealing with the union of like that for them it's very natural to be like hey i want to screw you let's screw yes and so like that is where i think this movie does this sort Mm -hmm. of nudity and women's sexual empowerment so much better than what we even see in like today standards yeah because there isn't this like villainization of the guys there's not like oh she's prowling or preying upon people Mm -hmm. as like that's the spooky part it's just a awareness that we don't normally get to see yeah it's not like teeth where the uh her boyfriend kind of pressures her into sex he gets his penis ripped off the gynecologist gets his fingers bit off okay there's not a lot like teeth so i don't (laughs) know why that would be your go-to comparison Oh, because you talked about, like, the demasculation of men. Sure. I think that one is a bit more aggressive than I was originally thinking. Okay. Normally, it's more of like, oh, she's into her sexuality and is, like, pursuing guys who don't want it. Mm. And usually, Howie is not the only man who's like, how dare you be naked in front of me? And unfortunately, Howie is the only one not naked on this island. So, like, he's the problem. Okay. Makes you sense. You see what I mean? Yeah, okay, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's less of the horror um, genre that you're used to. Yes. And more of the, like, standard horror practice is, like, he's taking advantage of her, so she's going to get, like, she's going to kill him. Mm-hmm. Or um, she is getting what she wants, and that makes her evil. Okay. Yeah. Because, again, sense. remember, like, we, we got to lower the horror bar standards. This is the 70s. <laughs> yeah, I... I think teeth is in my mind because I watched another movie called Penetration Angst. That's uh, about okay, a woman. Yeah. It's also just called Angst, but um, that it, would be a little easier to Google. Well, that's <laughs> what it is. Well, actually, it's Penetration Angst on IMDb, and it's just Angst on Netflix DVD. Perfect. Um, I love 
I love a backwardsness. Her vagina is a black hole, basically. That is fun. Yeah. <laughs> because in theory, that leads to a new place. But the movie gets awful. Well, yeah, because the science of that doesn't work. But, like, I love the concept. Just the plot's bad. Ah, duh. Bummer. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's You're just telling bad. me the plot of a lady with a black hole vagina is bad? I can't believe you. Uh, okay, <laughs> which, which movie? Because they're there. Yeah, I see. See. <laughs> the female ninja movies, they've got okay, that, the, too. Yeah. yeah. I would argue those are also bad, though. They're just, like, more fun. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but now it's time for the morning where... How he has survived the night of uh, the sexual attack. Oh my god, what a brave man. <laughs> the knocking on the doors. Actually, I wonder now if she actually was nude or if that was his imagination. That is a fun idea. I would like to think that Willow, in her own goddamn house, is just naked whenever she wants to be. Yeah, I, I believe <laughs> that. But it does actually pose an interesting question about how much of this movie is from, like... How much is skewed by his perspective? Like, exactly. how many people were actually naked running around the town? Yeah, hey, maybe he saw one people on the lawn and... And honestly, like, for a person with Howie's, like, rigidity and, like, pearl-clutching habits, Mm -hmm. I would 100%, like, believe that he saw one lady breastfeeding a child and was like, I saw so many boobs! (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But now Howie is taking a crash course on the old ways where we learn about the key members of the ritual, the hobby horse, the... Mad woman, the mad fool, Mm -hmm. who is also king for a day. Yes. Which, for the, like, standard audience, like, these are explained quickly and well enough that, like, if you do not have a good background on these characters, because they are pretty standard Mm -hmm. in folk stories and traditions even still today, it's explained well enough that you don't really need to know the whole idea and concept behind them all. It's pretty straightforward for this movie. Exactly. And he's also learning that in the bad times, they sacrificed humans. And this is why he knows Rowan's truly alive, because the crops failed last year. Which Which is honestly shit logic. But you know what? He's already proven to be a bad thinker, so. Yeah. Also, why is he reading this out loud? Because he apologizes to the woman next to him. Again, because Howie is stupid. (laughs) (laughs) And this is another reason why Howie doesn't have a partner. Because Howie reads out loud all the time. True, true. Can you imagine trying to get anything done and the person sitting at the desk next to you is reading their report out loud? The whole thing. My report says the guy pulled his gun on me. (laughs) Howie, please read in your head. (laughs) Uh, But he is actually now trying to escape, despite his warnings of they, he won't like being on the island. He could have left a long time ago. Everyone's watching him, and it's, uh, I love this bit, too, because, like, they dingy him out, and he's like, my boat, my plane won't start. And they're like, well, I mean. Did you put gas in it? Have you tried turning it off and turning it mm-hmm. on again? Yeah, like, I like how, because this movie is from his point of view, it is implied that the, like, town like it is immediately implied that the townspeople are the one who fucks with his plane and like that's what's keeping him from going mm-hmm. there but because again because this is from Howie's point of view there also could be the chance that like his plane's just broke yeah well <laughs> and it's also a good scene too because we talked about him being watched all the time now he's being watched by people in masks and the moment he looks towards them they all duck out it's no longer the curious villagers I it's mean, like, I think it also is still the Curious Villagers, but they're Curious Villagers who are supposed to be somewhere. Yeah. Like, they no longer have time to loiter around. Yeah. No, exactly. And how he does eventually get brought back to land, where he's running through the village by being guided by the hobby horse, which, it, it, I love this part because we immediately, as we're watching it, you know how he's the fool. Oh, yeah. No, like, immediately. And... He gets to see them all, like, doing their preparations for the festival. Summer Owl has the moves. Um, yeah. There's the symbol, sun symbol, that Dark Souls has a similar symbol, to for, like, praise the sun. I mean, there's only so many ways to draw the sun. Yeah. And he, uh, now they're on the move because uh, Summer Owl's like, Nuada, god of the sun, hail the queen of May. It is time for festivals. Yeah. And, but you know what? How he's going to do his damnedest. He is, uh, gonna break into everything. Howie is, again, a terrible cop. No, he is. He is 
just fucking shit up, and he is so stupid too. I, I, you know, I get, I get. There's adrenaline. Yes. But Howie has not thought clearly since he saw that first hit. No, not at all. Because he thinks like maybe Rowan's in a trunk that turns out to be a doll, which is so much smaller than what Rowan is. And also, she's been in that trunk for how long, my dude? Yeah. Like, no. Good try, though. Exactly. And all the kids are screwing with him. Like, the one kid falls out of the closet and is like, but also ha, like, ha, ha. But also, like, this is a day of celebration and, like, fool and gesture. Like, as far as the kids know, like, he knows what he's signed up for. Mm-hmm. Because also, like, this character would have been given, like, free reign to go into people's houses, pulling some pranks, doing shit. Be, yeah. Be an idiot all over town. Go no. bring some smiles. Yeah, he's even checking coffins. Which is a little funny. It is. And especially, it's a little funny. Especially because there's actually the dead person There's actually dead people them. in there. Yeah. yeah, with coins over their eyes, too. Yeah, which he's, like, shocked there's dead people in the coffins. <laughs> <laughs> like, did you think they were all full of rabbits? You dummy. Yeah. But being exhausted, he returns to the tavern. Uh, time to rest, but he's overhears them plotting of, like, make sure he's not disturbed. And then he's like, okay, we'll we'll take care of him. And he wakes up and there's a hand of glory next to him. I I do love that because, again, this is all from his very paranoid point of view. He hears all of this and like is like, ah, I am fucked. Yeah. <laughs> or no, he's like, oh, I know what they're doing. I know I'm going to I'm still going to solve it. You clearly don't know what is going on. You were the you were the most useless person they could have sent. You read two sentences in a book, and now you think you're the expert on their culture. The thing, okay, but here's the thing that really, really gets me is it's implied that how he's Catholic, right? Like at the very beginning, there's enough of these very old traditions that Catholicism overlaps with. Mm-hmm. We'll leave the whys and hows out. That Howie should be somewhat familiar with some of these practices, even if his specific church didn't do them. But it's because his church is the right church to do it. That's the thing. I think Howie is, like, in deep on a speci- like a very specific version of Catholicism. He's a fundamentalist. Yeah, but yeah. also, like, a like fundamentalist that only exists in this, like, one church. In they don't one, have branch services. In this one person. Yes. Howie's one version of church. He feels very much like the father from The Witch. Yeah. 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 I'm the purest. Yeah. Which cracks me up because clearly, like, he hasn't been listening to, like, service. Yeah. Or gone to a single other church. I'm the purest even though I've broken into houses. I've broken into a photography shop. I steal the fool's costume and join the procession. Which, like... Knock out the bar owner, even though the bar owner's been the nicest person to you here. That's true. Yeah, like, they've let you put a lot of shit on tab, my guy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, it's... This dancing scene is so dumb, but great. I I love it. I love the frolicking of... Yes, I do, too. (laughs) Lord Summer Isle and just like he seems to be having a great time. Well, and he's also an ass about everything too, because I mean he obviously knows how he's in the fool's costume. Yeah, but also like again, this is the movie sets all this up so that if you do not know these traditions mm-hmm. or a version of these traditions, like you can follow along fairly well. Yeah, but the tradition is the fool gets to take over the Lord's like stuff and possessions and like be an ass for the day in place of the Lord and be like, ha look how much of an ass I am. Yeah. Well, he also brings up that he says, he says to him, and this is why how he thinks he's on to what well, he's, he's doing good mm-hmm. is he's, he says, have you, he refers to him as the innkeeper. Have you been drinking from your own stash? Yes. Do you call that dancing? Yes. And like the entire point of a lot of these like traditions and festivals mm-hmm. is to like rile each other up. And so like, this is why I think a lot of the townspeople are not like, tee hee hee, we're going to burn the man. Yeah. But more like, oh, yeah, that's what happens every year. Oh, yeah. The cow headed people also kind of remind me of Gozu a little bit. A little bit, but like also like, don't mask. Yeah. But now it's time for one of the cooler scenes in this movie, too. Yes. The chopping ritual. Chop, chop, chop. Which I love the how the filming of the procession and the tension building. Even though, like, the hinges in the background are a bit rough yeah. on closer inspection. Yeah, well, you know, it's fine. I like how everyone is just toying with him. And there's that buildup of, like, oh, 
Uh, sometimes they chop people's heads off. Yeah. And like yes, and it's all like clearly over the top and played up. Yeah. No. Exactly. And how he is so upset, he can't. He cannot. <laughs> And they're all showing him how much everything before this is play, but how he's not understanding the game. No. And also, while it, be- again, because this is all from Howie's point of view, it's implied that, like, Howie is already, like, chain and shackled, being led. hmm It's really not. Like, probably Howie could still leave. Howie's, again, just the dumbest man on the planet. If Howie had stayed in his boat, or if he had actually slept in the hotel room. Or if he had even just, like, been like... I'm not putting on the clown costume. Good try, guys. Yeah. He probably would have lived. Oh, because he's a good guy. Because eventually they get to the beach where they're sacrificing ale to the god of the sea. Some krill are getting real shit-faced tonight. I really hope there's, like, one random whale out there just being like, hell yes. Fuck yeah. I come back here every year, man. (laughs) Burning man, baby. Hell yeah. (laughs) Uh, But, oh shit, it's Rowan. Ah, what? Surprise, said no one. And he grabs her and they go on this journey through a cave system while there's like rock music playing. Yeah, I don't fully like I get the rock music is supposed to like Mm -hmm. be like enhancing the tension and elevation and heart rate and all that sort of stuff. I, she seems to be playing along, too. She's just like, wow, this man's really into the uh, the idea. Yeah. Well, because that's exactly what it is, because they're, he leads up to the path, and everyone else has got They got up there real quick, too. Yeah, he, they're all like, wow, normally this takes a lot longer, because you know, normally you all kiss in the cave or something. Yeah. And now it's it's uh, he is the fool, because there's no escape, and he came of his own free will. And they and- also like did tell you what was going on, and you were just... Not listening. And he was heavily guided. I mean, in another term, if he came of his own free will, he would have been saved. This is true. Yeah. This is true. (laughs) But the game's over. He was the right kind of adult, which, how the fuck do they find him in the first place? Of like, how do they track down of like, oh, this is the purest man in our land. Okay, so, again, I think this is a part that is Howie's interpretation. I think Howie is... Even in his, like, being told, hey, we're going to murder you, in his weird twisted mind, he's like, they're doing this because I'm the best person. Well, they tell him he's the Well, yeah, I can I would I would argue they tell every sacrifice you're the best person, regardless yeah. of, like, how you've, quote unquote, lived your life. Because how he's the best in his own, like, weird twisted world. Yeah. These people do not consider him the best. <laughs> He's the best sacrifice. For this time period. For today. Because they want the cure, clean, pure virgin. I think that is how he put them words in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but they also are using his own religion to taunt him of like, you know what? You're going to die a martyr. Just think of this as a good death for you too. That, like they know what buttons to push for him. Mm-hmm. And it's a little funny. Oh yeah. And they everyone acts like the government's not going to come for him of like, well, They're they could, not. They're really not. They probably could sink his boat and be like, uh, we never saw him. They're Whether, organized. This is the best conspiracy mm-hmm. theory cover-up group ever. Yeah. Also, clearly no one at the office liked Howie. I bet no. you the amount of work they put into finding him is minimal. Oh, yeah. Well, a, but this seems also important, too, because Howie is true to himself still at this point. He's not He's gonna very into his own fantasy. Yeah, but now is... The most iconic part of this movie. It's wonderful. It's the appointment with the Wicker Man. Yes. And I love how Howie is just talking back to them of fruit's not meant to be grown here. He's so desperate. He warns that he warns them that next year the crops are going to fail, and then they'll come for Summer Isle next. And it's finally They're like, sure, my dude, whatever. Yeah. We've been doing this a while. Did you see all those photos? <laughs> and it's finally the Wicker Man. Woohoo! Which, let me read you how the Wicker Man is described in Commentaries on the Gaelic War by Julius Caesar. Yes, I also found this, yes. Others have figures of vast size, the limbs of which formed of osiers. They fill with living men, which be, which being set on fire, the men perish enveloped in the flames. And the director and writer have had found this and were like, that's terrifying yeah i love it because the design for the wicker man went through multiple drafts some had daisies for the eyes 
Oh, that's cute. And different faces. Sure. But eventually, the guy who created it uh, settled down. He started doing a sketch with nothing on it and realized that worked because you put your impression on mm-hmm. the faceless creature. Hello Kitty style. I love it. Yeah. And also something I want to bring up that I found interesting in my own research is the changing of ideas from the Roman depiction to the modern one. Okay. Because, it, again, in commentaries on the Gaelic War, mm-hmm. right after that phrase is stated, uh, G- Caesar writes, they consider that the uh, oblation of such as have have been taken in theft or robbery are an offer or yeah, or any offerance is more acceptable to the immortal gods. But when a supply of that class is waning, they have recourse to obtain even the innocent. Okay. So okay. basically it's this changing of, okay, well, we'll sacrifice the worst of our society. These are the people who have done bad mm-hmm. to these gods to appease them of like, sorry, we these person, these people are awful. We'll make the next people better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To now, okay, well, we only want the pure. Yes. Yeah. It is a much more modern interpretation. Yes. And also, there's something interesting that Eli Roth mentioned, that this was a virgin sacrifice, basically. Even though, like, normally when we put into pers- when we think of a virgin sacrifice, it's a young maiden. Yes. Yeah. Which is interesting, and again, why I know the movie does attempt to very much read that way, mm-hmm. but why I do think that is in Howie's head is because they do not seem to be terribly concerned with virginity as a culture. No, that's exactly why, because they're trying to get the outs- the pure outsider. Y- yeah. And Again, also, I think this is still in Howie's head, though. Also weirdly taunt him, too. Because, like, if he had screwed Willow... He would have been fine, and they would have used someone else on the island and given a different reason. Rowan. The Maybe. pretty one. Like, they, there's a lot of other reasons they could have given. And his head, he's like, ah, see, I didn't fuck the pretty lady. So that's why. Yeah. And also there's animals in here because bonus? Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you're going to build a giant wicker man to burn someone, you might as well put mm. a few bonus creatures in there, right? Yeah. And there are rumors that the uh, an- that some animals were burned and it's fake. The director said that they were very careful about that. And he spread the rumors himself to fuck with the ASPCA. Good for him. <laughs> Which we have a great ending at the sunset. They light the wicker man on fire. The head falls off. They're all chanting. It's and- pretty iconic looking. Yeah. And... Uh, how he's still trying to save himself, convince them that they're wrong, which his speech falls upon deaf ears, which his speech was also the last speech of Sir William Rayleigh. Great. Yeah, well, before he was cut, or before he was beheaded. Nice. Yeah. Very, I mean, poetic. A fool's death. A fool's death. Which also lasts a little bit of trivia. Mm-hmm. The song they're singing is the oldest Anglo-Saxon song called Summer is Ecunum in. Very good. I know I butchered that. So. <laughs> good enough. Uh, yeah. So that's the Wicker Man. Very good. It was not a hit when it came out, but well, it developed a cult following. There was a few reasons for that. Yes, something Eli Roth mentioned that was due to the difficulty in categorizing the movie. Yes, they had a hard time of trying to figure out where to let it be shown. Yes, and when because they tried marketing it between horror and an art film. Yes. And which, it very much is so, but it's not like the same there wasn't, art film of like Midsummer. Well, and also there just wasn't a lot of people who were into that category of film yet. Like mm-hmm. it wasn't a big enough group to like be like to like draw a crowd like Midsummer did. No, exactly. And I think it's just because this era we we go through this era of like where witchcraft is in trend, then it's not, and now yeah. it is. This was really at the beginning of a new wave of it. Yeah, I mean it's it's the one that created it. That is true. Yeah. Also, like because they didn't quite know where to put it, there was a lot of ask for cutting here and there, mm-hmm. which led to a lot of lost footage. Yeah, the distributor cut the original showdown because the, the director said it was a tad long for what it was sure. and for the time. Um, but also, the studios just fucked with the editing quite a bit, and there were religious elements in the beginning that were originally cut, too. Additional religious elements. That, well, and part of it, if you watch the longer cut version of the movie, 
there is a uh, there's a di- noticeable dip in quality between mm-hmm. the ones that were restored and the films that they couldn't because they didn't have enough money to fully restore the cut. Yes. So and there there's even stuff on there's even additional filming yes. on top of what we watched. Yes, which is part of the reason why we're very excited for the new DVD release. So at least it all looks continuous. It'd be interesting to see what they add if anything at all. Or at least touch up cuz this movie does look very good despite being both aged and mm-hmm. flipping pretty hard between being restored and not. Yeah. Well, Lee even uh, offered to pay critics to see the movie because they thought they were missing out. And he even offered to pay them, but they they the critics went without the payment. They just went in and saw it and they loved the movie. Yeah. Because and Lee only even said he did this because he thought the movie was purposely being squashed, partly because the studio had a new head, and normally when uh there's a new head to a studio, they try squashing anything else the previous studio did, kind of like a new yeah. King Lion coming in, killing off the old offspring. Yeah, and also they tried to put this as a B picture and double bill it with mm-hmm. the movie Don't Look Now, which do- that's not really a way to get people to go see your film. It's more of like a, hey, we're already at the theater. You want to go see the double feature? Yeah. So, like, that wasn't helping either. There yeah. wasn't a lot. Uh, it also didn't have a whole lot of, like, advertisement to go with it. There wasn't, like, a bunch of movie posters anywhere that I could find. Yeah, there's movie posters, but there's also... A uh, lot of the posters seem to have come after the movie, though. Y- there's radio bits. There are the main one. There were some, but again, a lot of it seemed to be made and being pushed out after the movie mm-hmm. had already been out for a while. Yeah. And despite this, it was Lee or Hardy who mentioned that they were surprised how well it was received Despite the butchering. Now that I say that, that sounds like Lee. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it got a resurgence when young people wanted it restored. And they only had the director's cut at the time. And unfortunately, what they think happened is there was, they were building the M3 highway. Mm-hmm. And it, it was intentionally thrown. They lost at least 20 cans of film. Oof. With that said, though. Lee, to his dying day, thought very firmly and believed that those cans were not actually thrown under and that somewhere they were in storage or in a closet. And he he thought that in, to the end. That, that, that was his hope. That was the thing he refused to let go of. But he also thought that they were purposely lost. Yes. No, he very much yeah. agreed that like these were not being like, oh, I didn't realize I had them. He's like, no, we have them, but someone is holding them. Yeah. The only reason we have... A long cut. And a long cut of the 102 minutes, which is considered the director's cut. It was found in a collection of the American film producer, Roger Corman. And that's the only reason we have what we have today. So, likely, a lot of people are holding out hope that maybe someday, wherever Mm -hmm. these cans are, they will be released and freed to the world. But, realistically, it's probably not going to happen. Yeah. And despite all these issues, it did spawn an expanded novelization. Sure did. And there's the remake starring our beloved Nicolas Cage, which uh, Lee, which Lee, Lee hated. <laughs> don't uh, don't sugarcoat it. Lee was not impressed. I haven't read his reviews. I know he was bewildered. When I the commentary I listened to was before the movie was released, and he was yes. bewildered and concerned how they would even make that in the U.S. I I did find a an interview. Uh, granted, this was much after like both movies had mm-hmm. been released. And he was, he did say that, like, while he didn't think it was nearly as good, he did appreciate that there was, like, still appreciation for the film. Again, he's a very well spoken man. You could tell he was disappointed, much like a long lost father, but <laughs> he did his best to word it he, well. He wasn't angry, he was disappointed. <laughs> he wasn't angry, he was disappointed, yes. Yeah. Which, uh, so there, also on top of that, there was a 2009 stage production, mm-hmm. a spiritual sequel in the Fucking god awful movie, The Wicker Tree, yeah. which Christopher Lee does make a cameo or does make a reappearance as uh, Lord Summer Isle for a very small minute. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, we mentioned it very briefly ahead earlier, but like one of the actual inspirations for Burning Man was this movie. Yes, even though <laughs> Burning Man will deny it, uh, they will. But we have some pretty solid proof. It's too similar, and I mean. <laughs> And it did come out after the yeah, movie, and after. pretty much everyone who was involved had seen the movie. Yeah, and on top of that, there were uh, there were potential sequels at some point. Uh, there was supposed to be a trilogy for this, but you know that yeah. didn't happen. So the sequel was they were starting it in 1989, mm-hmm. and they had a short script in the 
movie's name is awesome. The Loathsome Latum Worm. That is a great working title in the very least. That, um, how he was supposed to survive the events of the Wicker Man. The, yes. But Hardy didn't want anything to do with it. I fully agree with that. Yes. But Hardy also wanted to do, brought up later on in like the early 2010s that he wanted to do a sequel called The Wrath of the Gods. But when he died in 2016, nothing has come to pass. He had been trying to fundraise or crowdfund the money for that to get Mm -hmm. it started. They were like $20,000 short of their goal, unfortunately, when he he passed. For shame. For shame. Will someday that be created? Probably. Let's not lie to ourselves. Yeah. Well... And on top of that, I think the Wicker Man still has a cultural relevance because oh, for sure. rewatching it, you're in on the game, but really the movie is also a commentary on like to be not be a fool mm-hmm. and just go with the flow of others, which is also very much a commentary on the dangers of cults. Yes. Where really, even though like paganism celebrated today and everything, you can take it too far. Any any oh, religious sect can, can be take a, it too far. Honestly, anything can be a cult. Yeah. Yeah. You take it too far, you've you've reached cultum. The the other thing that I think keeps Wicker Man still relevant in horror movies specifically mm-hmm. is its wonderful ability to remind us that there is a way to write horror where there are outs for our main character, mm-hmm. the main character doesn't need to be, like, a very specific archetype. Like, honestly, Howie is pretty far from the standard horror movie uh, victim. Mm-hmm. And on, and have it still come out to be a very compelling and scary film. Exactly. So, yeah. I don't know. I love so much about this movie. Oh, I, same. This movie's great. I had originally seen the Nick Cage one before this one. So, when I came and rewatched, when I watched this, I'm like, oh, this is... Quite different and quite much better than the original. It or, is. It is different. The original I saw. Yes. I will say, uh, since we have seen both versions mm-hmm. and had the chance to like sit down and like compare them by watching them fairly close together, enough to remember the majority of it, mm-hmm. I will say, I, I don't necessarily think the shit the Nick Cage versions gets is fully worth it. Is it over the top? Yes. I would argue, though, it is a fun reinterpretation and retelling mm-hmm. to, like, I, I don't want to say modernize, but I do want to use the term in, like, how filming and acting was changing for what is essentially a B-horror film. Yeah. Like, it does continue on that trend, and whether or not you like it, The Wicker Man started out as low budget with not a lot of promotion and not a lot of backing behind it. That. Puts the it in the B category. Cult following. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they're both good. One is just silly. <laughs> yes. So on our good, bad, weird scale, Chris, what do you rate this movie? This specific one for me is solely good. If we had brought the Nick Cage into it, that would have pushed a weird. Mm-hmm. But just this one for me is good. For me, I think I'm going to go into the good weird I understand that. Just because some of the film choices and also some of the music choices at points are a bit weird. Yes. I I agree with you. I am holding off adding the weird because I do completely see mm-hmm. where you're coming from. I'm holding out the weird for the new release where everything has been fixed and colorized together. I think there is a lot of very subtle editing that would fix the weird for me. There's a lot of color that like... I know I'm hypersensitive Mm -hmm. to that I think is meant to be in the movie, but gets lost because there was some retouching that just wasn't done to the entire film. No. Same thing with sound mixing. I think while the music is excellent, I do think it stands out too hard in some spots. Yeah. Just just a little bit. Which could be fixed with some just minor, minor editing. Yeah. So would you recommend this movie? Oh my God. Hell yeah. Same. Granted, there's again as with all horror films there is a small caveat of people who i would not recommend this to Mm -hmm. that number though is very few even for my not horror group the actual horror bits are so small that you can blink or go to the bathroom and be done with them and like once yeah well and i i think this one is definitely one to 
return to. I oh, mean, for sure. We're, we're recording this because of May Day and we thought, okay, it, it's time to do the Wicker Man. Yeah, because every time I post Happy May Day, you post <laughs> memes <laughs> from this movie. <laughs> yes. No, exactly. And yeah, I I, th- I definitely recommend this movie because it's. I think it's one of those horror films where it fits in this area where people who don't like horror mm-hmm. would like this movie too. Mm-hmm. So there's definitely that range for it too. I also think that if you have seen it, but it has been a while, this is one of the few horror films that is not necessarily like, wow, I rewatch it because I love it and I think it's the best horror film. I think this is a rewatch to specifically deep, like, watch and think about different parts of this film. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of thought put behind this. Like, this was, for a lot of these guys, their sole life work. This was it. And they put a lot of effort into it. And you can tell. Like, you could spend a lot of time analyzing each character, each theme. Mm -hmm. And while their sources for a lot of this weren't solid, they did their research. There is a lot behind this. No, exactly. Even though interpretive but it is but at the same time a lot of these traditions end up being interpretive too so if you find them interesting it is a great starting point for investigating even the modern day traditions yeah exactly so and normally we would say goodbye here but for year five of the podcast we are playing a little game at the end yes we are playing and i've 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 held off on bringing up this director for quite a while because we kind of had this in mind yeah we are playing a game called The Three Degrees of Takashi Miike. Which is a game that is not necessarily... It is new for you podcast friends. It is not new to us who have inhabited Nico's couch before. Yes. I actually brought it up yesterday to a new lad who is coming over who was aware of Takashi Miike. His girlfriend had to watch Audition for yes. an art class. We had vetted him before we brought him over. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Uh, but I, I know, and for long-term listeners, have heard me shoehorn Takashi Miike and his stuff. Yes, we're So aware. we thought we'd coordinate, a, we'd make a game based off the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. A great game. And for those who are unfamiliar with the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon or Bacon's Law, it's a parlor game where players challenge uh, each other to arbitrarily choose an actor and then connect them to another actor uh, via film uh to both actors or both actors have appeared in we're doing directors as well in this one and writers uh repeating the process to try and find the shortest path to ultimately tip the prolific american actor kevin bacon there was a version of this game for those who are unfamiliar with kevin bacon as i know that was a little bit later the newer version of this game i understand is the three clicks to jesus which is where you open a random wikipedia page and in I think three to five clicks, your goal is to get to Jesus Christ. 60 seconds of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. That is also a good example. Yes. <laughs> um, but we are going to do a little bit of twist and playing around with the connections because while I was fiddling around, and yes, we are using a website called the Oracle of Bacon.org. It is a um, handy website. We are bringing it down to three degrees to make it tighter. Also because you're too good at this fucking game. Yeah. Has to be a movie connection. Okay, that does help. Because of TV shows, we, we're we not a TV show podcast. And also, like, a so. lot of these guys hang out together. Yeah. And I cannot... And basically, this is me fighting the connections, just so everyone's clear. Yeah, because I don't have them. No. Cannot use the same connection, i.e. a movie, an actor, writer, or director twice. Okay. As well as, I'm going to try my damnedest... To make the plot and thematic ties as applicable as possible. Boy, you're making this hard for yourself. I'm so proud of you. Yes, very much so. For those who also would like to play along at home, the way those of us who are not Nico usually play this game is if Nico manages to successfully do a Takshimike connection, the rest of us have to either finish our drink or take a shot. Yes. And for this game, if I win... Next season, we do a full month of Takashi Miike movies. And if Chris wins, she gets an entire month to choose whatever we review. Doesn't have to be themed. It can just be whatever garbage she wants to force down my eye holes. I have given it a lot of thought on what I will force down your eye holes. And the current running winner, ladies and gentlemen, if Nico for some reason manages to fail this game, is we will be covering the delightful movie Princess and the Popper starring Barbie herself. Because of the new Barbie movie coming out. Oh, God. Well, the stakes are up there, then. The stakes are high, Nico. (laughs) 
So drum roll. The first episode connection is uh, I went with Gary Cowper, who played Rowan Morrison. She is uh, in Little Lord Fa- uh, Fauntleroy with Bill Nye, who uh, not that Bill Nye. Oh, damn. Who was with uh, who was in uh, Minamata with June uh, Kunimura. Uh, well, now we've done it. Who was in, and this is a bold move for me, uh-huh. who was in Audition directed by Takashi Miike. A movie about a fool being led through a game that he doesn't know he's playing. I will accept and I will finish my beer. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> but anywho, this has been the Good, the Bad, and the Weird podcast. Thanks for listening. Peace! Thank you for stopping by this here town of the Good, the Bad, and the Weird. We appreciate your listenership, and if you want more of our takes in your life, feel free to check us out on social media at The Good, The Bad, and The Weird Podcast, or TGTBTW for short. As well, if we missed a fact, your favorite part of a movie, or just have a suggestion and want to reach out and say howdy, feel free to email us at TGTBTWpodcast at gmail.com. And feel free to join our Discord at The Good, The Bad, and The Weird Podcast, where we talk about movies, just share random banter here and there. And always check out our podcasters, streamers, or any other content creator we shout out in our episodes. We really appreciate it. And as always, thank you for listening. Peace.